Good afternoon. Welcome to the Phoenix City Council's meeting of Wednesday, April 7th. Thank you for joining us. I will now call the meeting to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilman DeCicio. Here. Councilmember Garcia. Councilwoman Guardado. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Here. Councilwoman Pastor. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Vice Mayor Williams. Here. Mayor Gallego. Here. Welcome everyone. Uh, we have an interpreter with us here today to provide Spanish uh, interpretation. Elsie, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, Mayor, thank you. As you previously mentioned, my name is Elsie Duarte, and together with my colleague, uh, Ms. Cota, we will be servicing as Spanish interpreters for today's meeting. We ask as a favor, if you will be providing public comment to please try to speak slowly and clearly so that we can try to interpret what you are saying as fully as possible. I'll take uh, some time now to introduce myself to our Spanish-speaking audience. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Elsie Duarte y junto a mi colega Carmen Cota estaremos sirviéndoles como intérpretes durante la junta de hoy. Les pedimos como favor, si es que va a estar dando un comentario público, hable despacio y deténgase después de cada pocas oraciones para que podamos interpretar lo que se esté diciendo de manera más completa posible. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Will the city clerk please read the 24-hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G7, sorry, G6718, 6818, and 6828 through 6833 S47417 through 47464 and resolutions 21906 through 21915. Thank you so much. As part of the city council meetings, we receive uh, comments from the public. We enjoy, enjoy and our benefit from civil discourse. If you can please provide comments on the policy items, that is very helpful and avoid any personal attacks or uh, foul language. Um, I will turn to our city attorney to provide a little bit more detail about public comment. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the public may speak for up to two minutes to comment on agenda items to be discussed. Comments must be related to the agenda item and the action being considered by the council. General comments that go beyond the scope of the agenda item must be made during the citizen comment session at the end of the agenda. Speakers must present their comments in a respectful and courteous manner. Profane language and personal attacks on members of the public, council members, or staff are not allowed. A person who violates these rules will lose their opportunity to continue to speak. Thank you. We look forward to productive public comment. Uh, should this meeting extend past three hours, I will likely uh, recess us for a break at that time or at a time when we have a natural break such as after an agenda item so that may be around 5 or 5 30. Uh, with that I will turn to the vice mayor for a motion on boards and commissions. I move to approve the mayor and city council boards and commission nominations. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in the favor please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please signal nay. Passes unanimously. We next move to the liquor license applications portion of our agenda. The city council advises the state on liquor licenses. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? I move to approve items two through 30. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please signal nay. That passes unanimously. City Clerk, are we ready for ordinances, resolutions, new business, and planning and zoning? Yes, Mayor. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? I move to approve items 31 through 116, except the following. 
claims 38 through 44, 46, 48, 60, 69 to 73, 76, 113, and 114. Noting 109 has been withdrawn. Item 115 is requested to be continued to June 2nd, 2021, and excluding these items for public comment, 61 and 116. Second. Could you add, oh, could you add number 71 onto that? I, I heard 73, but I didn't hear 71. This is Sal. Okay, I add item 71. Mayor, just to clarify, to just to clarify the motion, is it 69 through 73? If, no, it would be 69 through 70 and then 71 then be excluded, 72 and 73. Thank you. Yeah, she does. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a motion. Any comments? We'll call. To Cecil. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Castor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes nine zero. Thank you. We next move to item 38, which is the National Association of City Transportation Officials membership dues. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? Roll call. Decisio. No. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. I apologize. Pastor. Yes. Thank you. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 7 2. We next move to item 39, which is public comment on the proposed memorandum of understanding between the City of Phoenix and Layuna, Local 777. We will begin with a staff report on this item. I will introduce Human Resource Director Lori Bays. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council. The purpose of today's item is for the Council to have an opportunity to hear public comment on the proposed contract between the City and the Laborers International Union of North America, Local 777, representing Bargaining Unit 1. With me today is Ashley Pritchett, Acting Deputy Director and Lead Negotiator for the City with Layuna. As you'll recall, we began negotiations in early January, and we are pleased to say that we have now reached an agreement. I will provide you a brief overview of the agreement in your packets. You also have the proposed MOU with new language identified in bold font. We're just pulling up the slides. Okay, so I will go through some highlights of the agreement, specifically regarding our accountability and transparency items. This was a priority for us going into negotiations this year. I'll also talk about some other notable changes in the MOU, as well as the compensation package that was agreed to. So regarding accountability and transparency, as I mentioned, this has been a priority for our negotiating team with all of our labor unions. In this particular agreement, uh, the agreement clarifies language regarding the official HR files and specifies that no discipline may be removed and serious discipline may never be inactivated. 
It also allows serious discipline to be considered for compounding discipline purposes as well as during promotions or transfers throughout the employee's career. It also provides a mutually agreed upon party to serve on the grievance committee in lieu of a LIUNA representative. And it also standardizes our investigation protocols. Beyond that, it also outlines the continuation of three apprenticeship programs, which we are very proud of. Our gardener apprenticeship program, the solid waste equipment operator apprenticeship, as well as the street maintenance worker apprenticeship. And Layuna has been a great partner with us on those. And finally, I'll discuss the compensation package. Again, this has been uh, proposed consistently for all labor groups. In year one, we have agreed to an ongoing 1.5% of total compensation, as well as 2.5% of total compensation non-continuously or as a one-time payment. Additional compensation was also agreed to for the transparency and accountability items that I just mentioned. That includes an ongoing half percent of total compensation and a non-continuous or one-time payment of half percent of total compensation. In year two, we agreed to an ongoing one and a half percent of total compensation and a 2.5 percent non-continuous payment of total compensation. Beyond those compensation amounts, we also agreed to language uh, which allows the city, uh, specifically the city council, to uh, consider the labor groups, LIUNA in this case, in uh, your discussions around the American Rescue Plan Act Fund, as it does have a provision related to premium pay for essential workers. And finally, I just want to mention that LIUNA and the city have agreed to a fairness agreement, which uh, does provide them the benefit of any additional economic benefit that other labor groups receive subsequent to this agreement. And with that, we would, we would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Director Bass. Council member questions. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate our staff and Leona's hard work on this agreement. The apprenticeship programs have been a real credit to our city. I've had the pleasure of talking with employees who felt that they have really allowed them to invest in their own career and per, per, uh, pursue meaningful jobs within the city of Phoenix that leave our city stronger as well as their families stronger. So uh, thank you to the committee for that, those continued innovations. Councilwoman Guardado. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I also want to want to thank everyone um, for all the hard work. Um, this is, you know, this is this is tremendous work that was able to get done in the, in the middle of a pandemic. I um, just want to thank all of those workers who kept who kept our city clean and kept our city safe. Um, I know that there were many times where, you know, we had to readjust, um, put in more trash cans in the alleys, um, trying to figure out how do we keep kept everything clean as families were staying home and not being able to go out to work. Um, it was it was something that people had to get used to. Also love the apprenticeship programs um, that La Yuna is doing. I know that it's, and I love it um, because I know that it's part of, of making sure that we continue to work on having like a, a middle class and having good jobs at the city of Phoenix. Um, I take a lot of pride in talking about good jobs and and good health care and making sure that we're taking care of our workers that took care of us during this pandemic. I know that these are a lot of the workers that were hit the most um, du during the pandemic and had did not have a choice than to just go out there and give the best customer service that they could and in the moments where, where COVID was at its worst. So I just wanna thank everyone that put this together, that was part of the negotiations that made this happen. But most importantly, wanna wanna thank all of the LAYUNA members and its leadership for everything that you guys did for our city during this pandemic. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilmember Garcia. <clears throat> 
Thank you, Mayor. I had a quick uh, question for staff. Um, I know this is this is to you, Ed. Um, so my question is: There's a couple of units that we're not voting on today. If those units were to get, let's say, more pay, or or were to get a different agreement, how would that impact this contract or what's happening here today? Thank you, Mayor Councilmember Garcia, for that question. Um, it really illuminates the last point in Lori's presentation about the fairness agreement. So the fairness agreement is signed by, uh, it was actually in, the, in the, these first three contracts, and what that says is if another unit later gets a greater level of economic compensation, that that will then go and also apply to the units who have signed the contract with the fairness agreement. So to your question directly then, council member, if units that aren't being voted on today and come in two weeks or four weeks, if they get an extra half percent, that would extra half percent will then go to units, the units that are voted on today, in this case, unit one. Thank you. And so that goes for the economic side. Would that be the same for any dif differences in the accountability or transparency or other parts of the contract? Uh, Mayor Councilmember Garcia, no. The fairness agreement applies to economic issues only, not to issue non-economic issues of language in the contract. Thank you. Those, those are all the questions I had. Thank you, Council Member. I will now open the public hearing on item 39. I should mention that item 39 and item 40 are related items. All of the public comment will be on item 39 and then the council's vote will be on item 40. So it will be one public hearing for both of them. Um, we are excited to have comment from Jennifer Grundle. Hi, my name is Jennifer Grundle with Lane Local 777. We represent nearly a thousand workers has been referenced in unit one throughout the city of Phoenix. We are the women and the men that pick up the garbage recycling. We clean city streets, we clean the city park. We have gone to work every day during the pandemic, have worked with the public. We have obviously had great PPE, thank you to the city as well for that. We have talked to the public, educated them on what to do in the parks, what not to do during COVID. Um, we have ensured that everyone throughout the community is as safe as possible throughout all the job classifications that we have and work in. And they have worked relentlessly. I know that all of you, the mayor, vice mayor, city council have talked to many of our members and they work in the heat. They work in the rain. They, they don't have snow here. Well, you, there was snow here once this year, wasn't there? Or hail. Um, but they've never complained. They just go out every day to serve the community and to work. And this is the first time in this agreement in more than a decade that these employees will receive a pay increase in their checks. This is a real raise, something that they have waited for more than a decade. Since the Great Recession, they have not seen economic increase in their net. This agreement ensures they do. It also has a one time each year in August lump sum that thanks them for the hazardous work that they have done. They ensured we could stay safer at home while they weren't safer at home. They risked their health, their family's health every day to serve the community throughout Phoenix. And we're extremely grateful to be rewarded, not by just thank you, but also by the one time sum, which is listed in Lori's presentation. And we're also very excited to have accountability and transparency throughout the entire community because it's something that we do stand for and we feel strongly about. And the apprenticeship, as the mayor mentioned, is near and dear to all of our hearts. We absolutely love them. Um, we have watched folks that are unhoused, they're homeless. Sorry, it's two minutes. Sorry, mayor. <laughs> and we're happy to see that they're employed and able to help with their families. Thank you. Thank you so much for that testimony. Um, we will close the public hearing. And uh, Jennifer, please uh, do extend your uh, appreciation from the council member to your members. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? I move approval of the MOU uh, with uh, Limit 777, Unit 1. Second. On item 40, we have a motion for approval. 
of our MOU with Unit 1 and a second. Council member comments. Uh, Mayor, just a quick comment. Councilman DeCizio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And then Jennifer, thank you so much. And I want to express a special thanks to your workers. You're right. I would say the vast majority of them were there during the pan uh, during this last pandemic, along with police and fire, um, because they were there every day. Uh, you know, I've always voted against these type of contracts just because I don't agree with the, the structure of them. But that doesn't mean I don't respect and appreciate all the work that your workers put in to, to make our, si our city a better place. So Jennifer, as always, I wanna thank you for everything you've done. If you could transmit that to the workers, they've done an amazing job this year. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. And we appreciate it when you voted for the $15 minimum wage for these folks. So feel free to do it again. Council Member Garcia. I did, I support it. Thank you, Mayor, and, and yes, thank you, Sal, for supporting the $15 minimum wage. I, I too just want to congratulate Jennifer and all the workers. I know even us trying to figure out closing parks, opening parks, and all those sorts of things, it was you all that had to face the community um, while we were trying to figure out those decisions. So thank you all so much for, for working so hard this last year. Yes, I'm, I'm really happy you're getting a raise and you're getting this, this one-time payment. So similar to other folks, just please uh, relate to the workers that we appreciate them and we know how hard this has been and look forward to potentially finding more, way, more ways to support them with the money that's coming in the next couple of years. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I too wanna congratulate her for a job well done. She has always been creative, supportive, and her workers have been unbelievably good. So thank you very much. And I really love the apprenticeship programs. Councilwoman Guardado. Thank you. Thank you, Vice. Yeah, I, I also wanna congratulate Jennifer on a job well done. I, I, I wish I had your energy and the heart that you have to go out and, and represent these workers in such a tough year. I know that, you know, we had a lot of ups and downs and we had tons of conversations. So very excited um, to being able to see all of these workers get the raises and all the money and all the money that they deserve. And again, cannot thank them enough for all the work that they've done, that they always do, but especially during this pandemic, our park rangers, I, I think they were the first ones to really have to be out there and and talk to our constituents in, in a very difficult situation as we were trying to get used to COVID and understanding how COVID affected us or not. Uh, but yes, thanks, thanks to everyone, the leadership of Layuna. I don't know how workers would survive without um, being able to be represented by a union, so th they're very lucky, uh, but also thank want to thank them ev for every single thing that they do for our city. Thank you, Mayor. Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, I just really want to thank all of our staff and all the representation for our workers. I remember back in 2008, we had an economic downturn and a lot of these individuals had to take cuts and they also did furloughs and they just basically it was a team phoenix approach where they put in a little bit the city put in a little bit and we all made it all happen so you i just really want to thank you all for those sacrifices that you all have and now's the day that we return those favors back to to you all that have sacrificed so much time away from your family um those furlough days and also with the second with this um um, COVID-19, I mean, it's been not just an economic downturn, but now with this pandemic where you all are out there in the front lines, collecting our trash, working with the individuals that are going out to our parks, dealing with the water issues that we have, all the different departments of the city of Phoenix. I just really want to thank you all for your dedication and your hard work and making us the best ran city in the country and making us a, a place where people want to come and live with all these amenities that we have because of the hard work that you all did. So thank you. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you. Mayor, we're so lucky to have the staff that we have. They're so dedicated to serving our city. And I think this is a well-deserved raise for them. I wish we could give them more money. <laughs> 
They do such excellent work. Um, I, I can't boast and brag as much as I probably should because I know we have a long agenda. But again, I want to thank all of um, uh, Local 777 and all of our staff. Thanks. Thank you to my colleagues. Item number 40, roll call. Cecilia. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to be voting no, but Jennifer, please let your workers know that I did support them as the mayor and as Carlos brought up, and I do appreciate them bringing it up, the $15 increase and the minimum wage for them. I thought they well deserved it. Thank you, Mayor. Garcia. Thank you, yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Heck yeah. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 7 2. Thank you. We next move on to item 41, which is public comment on the proposed MOU between the City of Phoenix and the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association. Our Human Resources Director, Faze, will provide a brief presentation and then we'll begin the public hearing. Thank you, Mayor. Again, good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, the purpose of this item is also for the Council to have an opportunity to hear public comment on the proposed contract between the City and Phoenix Law Enforcement Association representing Bargaining Unit 4. With me today is Xavier Frost, Deputy HR Director and Lead Negotiator for the City with PLEA. As you'll recall, uh, we began negotiations also with PLEA in January and we have reached an agreement. I will provide you a brief overview of that agreement, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. For the agreement highlights, we will again focus on accountability and transparency, a couple of other notable changes, as well as the compensation package that we have agreed to with PLEA. Under accountability and transparency, this was the primary focus of the negotiations with PLEA this year. And there were some significant changes made to the contracts. The, the first one is that it removes warning language uh, that was or is currently provided to someone who makes a public a complaint, some, a member of the public who makes a complaint, excuse me. It also removes the employee's ability to purge or inactivate disciplinary action from files. It allows 10 categories of serious discipline to be considered for purposes of compounding discipline, promotions, or transfers throughout the employee's career. And it also provides for a representative from a different union to serve on the grievance committee to increase neutrality in that case. Additional items are that it allows the police chief discretion in scheduling a pre-termination hearing for an employee involved in a job-related felony crime. It removes the ability to use vacation time in lieu of a suspension. It also removes language which allows officers who are solely identified as witnesses in an investigation to meet with the union prior to interview. And it clarifies that any city entity, not just PA PSB, may investigate serious misconduct. A couple of other notable changes are that it clarifies that transfers are at the discretion of the chief and not grievable under the MOU. And it also adds some additional considerations regarding denial of off-duty work. Regarding compensation, again, this is the uh, package you just heard about in our agreement with Liuna. In year one, it provides an ongoing 1.5% of total compensation and a non-continuous or one-time payment of 2.5% of total compensation. In addition to that, for agreeing to the accountability and transparency measures that I just, um, that I just read for you, uh, it provides an additional half percent ongoing of total compensation and an additional half percent of one-time total compensation. And in year two, 
we have agreed to an ongoing 1.5% of total compensation and a non-continuous payment of 2.5% of total compensation. Beyond that, the American Rescue Plan Act fund consideration language is in this agreement as well, allowing the council to uh, consider plea in its provision of premium pay should it determine that it wants to do that. And we also have agreed to a fairness agreement with plea. So similar to what was described with LIUNA, if additional compensation is granted to other labor groups subsequent to this agreement being approved, then that additional compensation would also go to plea. Are there any questions that we can answer? Oh, Lori, I've got any one. Councilman DeCicio. Oh, there. So this doesn't include the meriting longevity as well, which I'm fully supporting on. I just want to make sure that represents about another three to 5%, correct? Per individual. Mayor, members of the council, um, there are no changes being proposed to the way that longevity is paid to employees. So that would remain as it exists today. So it depends on the number of years of service um, that the employee has with the city. But there are no changes being proposed. No, I'm fully to supportive that. of it. No, no, I, I didn't ask that. I just said that would represent about another three to 5%. I, I just want to point out that our police officers are going to be treated fairly here and they deserve a pay raise, but not only on top of the pay raise, which I'm going to be supporting, they're also gonna be getting merit and longevity, which should represent about another three to 5% per individual. I just wanna make sure that that's correct. Yes, Mayor, uh, Councilman DeCicio, that's generally correct. The percentage does vary depending on how long the employee has been in a longevity status, but you know, by and large, that's, that's a correct estimate. Thank you for that, Lori. Thank you, Councilman. Councilmember Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, question for staff, and we've been asked by community to have a more transparent process when it comes to these negotiations, and we've seen other cities go in this direction. Um, so I guess the question for Ed or Lori, um, can you explain why uh, we don't have more public access to these negotiations? And is that something that we can do in the future? Uh, Mayor Councilmember Garcia, thank you for that question. The history of negotiations at the city that goes about 45 years at least has been that like traditional negotiations, they do occur uh, confidentially and privately. Uh, in fact, we sign uh, agreements with each side uh, to that effect. So our practice at the city has been that these that the negotiation is done by representatives of management, elected representatives of labor. We brief the council and uh, we try to reach an agreement. Should the council want to do something differently, they would certainly have that power and authority to direct staff to do, uh, to conduct the negotiations in a different manner. Thank you. Um, I guess I just, Quick comment for the folks that, that are gonna be speaking the public. I just wanna thank everyone who's shown up virtually today to speak on, on particularly the police contract and thank the community and the families that have been impacted um, for continuing to speak on police accountability. Um, we know that you've been showing up even though in these negotiations in particular, you've been left off the table, um, even though the, the impacts uh, greatly, the outcomes greatly impact our communities. And so I hope as a council, we can look um, to incorporating more public access uh, for these negotiations in the future. Um, and then I'll save more comments for after the public. Thank you. Thank you. Items 41 and 42 are companion items. The comments will be on item 41 during a public hearing, then we will close the public hearing and move to item 42, which is the actual um, vote on the item. With that, I will open the public hearing and turn it over uh, to 
Matthew to call members of the public. Thank you, Mayor. Our first speaker on item 41 is Dominic Benelli. Dominic, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir, please proceed. Okay, so I oppose agenda items 41 and 42. I think it's ridiculous that this memorandum of understanding is even being considered. Um, black and brown activists have been saying for decades that giving more money to police or police unions is not a solution for police accountability or transparency. Um, police accountability looks like firing officers that threaten our communities. Police accountability looks like defunding and reallocating police funds to community programs. Police transparency looks like independently investigating Chief Williams and the TRU. Uh, the reforms in this memorandum are performative at best. Uh, changes like removing threatening language from police complaint forms and disallowing officers to use vacation time towards suspension should have already been implemented. I'm actually kind of shocked that like we even have to like talk about they're even still there. Um, it's it's absurd that plea wants more money for these changes. Um, I've heard people argue that increasing funding for plea incentivizes positive reform, but why should we give plea more money for some changes that have already should have already existed in the first place? Um, this line of thinking implies that social change comes through the white supremacist power structure and not through the voices of police communities. And so here we see another instance of how police power doesn't come from the people being policed. So I ask you, who do you represent? Do not approve of this memorandum. I yield my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hava Derby. Hava, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Yes, um, once again, this contract is being negotiated behind closed doors. It should be open. There's no reason it can't be. So hopefully in the future, we're not uh, showing up after the fact. This police contract is full of weak reforms and more money for Phoenix police. And letting cops negotiate this contract behind closed doors has resulted in one of the most violent and unaccountable departments in the country. Uh, so much more money that does not belong in the hands of cops. You want to bribe them to uh, participate in an accountability and transparency proposal, 0.5%. This is similar to 2018's demand to uh, give them raises to use body cameras. It's just bribery. This transparency and accountability compensation is nothing but an excuse to give cops more money. And if we're at the point where we have to bribe cops to be honest and accountable, this department is way past reformable. We already know it's past reformable. You want to give another raise, 1.5%, and a non-continuous 2.5 raise. Giving police pay raises is rewarding them for a year of national embarrassment, endless scandals, and anti-black violence. They killed our neighbors, had white supremacists within their ranks exposed, and colluded with the county attorneys to prosecute pr protesters. A vote in favor of this budget is a vote for white pr uh, supremacy. You also want to use COVID relief funds from the American Rescue Plan Act to give cops extra pay. This money needs to go to resources like no cap and people that need it. Giving it to cops to pay for bonuses while thousands of Phoenix residents struggle to recover isn't increasing community safety, it's causing harm. And then you have your special assignments unit, one of the deadliest and most violent units in the police department. It's a death squad made up of officers who have a history of shooting community members and using extreme violence and giving them the team leaders a 5% raise is a slap in the face to all of the families who have lost loved ones to this unit. You need to reject this contract. Our next speaker is Vanessa DiCarlo. Vanessa, are you on the line? Can you, can you hear me? Vanessa? Hi. I, I, I can hear you. Um, We've got some noise. Can oh, is that better? Yes, that's better. Please proceed. W wonderful. Thank you. Um, Mayor Kate, on April 6th, in response to Governor Ducey's order, you chose courage over comfort and challenged the mask mandate in a social media stating, protecting public health must come first. I want to reiterate that the American Medical Association policy statement recognizes police brutality as a as a product of structural and the significant harms triggered by these this excessive police force and as a product of structural racism include communities of high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, premature mor morbidity, and death. 
Um, also, the American Academy of Pediatrics last year published a policy statement about how racism was a core cause of health problems in children. And research also shows how, that has been conducted shows that the impact of police brutality um, directly impacts citizens and students' grades, not just the folks that it's directly um, targeting, but also the community members at large. It is critical that this issue be identified also as a public health risk. We know that the MOU protects police. It, it prevents accountability. It prevents the violence that they are continually perpetrating on um, between PPD and MCAO. So it is, it is very, very um, critical that you do not sign this union agreement and that you vote against this matter. Um, also, another statement that you had stated was very powerful. Um, when we see hate, what we must actively combat it in response to Asian, anti-Asian um, hate and white violence. And I need you to look at this issue in the same way and protect black and brown communities in the same way that you have stood up for the other issues. Um, please vote no on this and I defer my time. Our next speaker is Cynthia Garcia. Cynthia, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you, we can hear you. There's a little background noise if you could turn down your volume a bit. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to come and speak and say um, the city needs to hold police uh, department accountable and stop protecting um, violence um, and stop rewarding violence. Um, giving police more money is not going to help them become more transparent. Um, and uh, Cynthia, are you still there? It looks as though we've uh, lost the connection with Cynthia. So our next speaker is Denise Garcia. Denise, are you on the line? It looks as though Denise has lost the connection. Our next speaker is Anissa Groves. Anissa, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Some are saying this MOU is extremely progressive, but I see no evidence of that. All that was done is that a handful of the most disgusting and egregious items were struck through. And then you all agreed to pay the police more for that minuscule concession. How is that progressive? It doesn't even amount to harm reduction. Council member Garcia, yes, you all need to do whatever it takes to ensure these negotiations are 100% public. That needs to happen as an immediate priority and should be considered the bare minimum starting point for addressing the harm police causes. Beyond that, I'm hoping against hope that you, Councilmember Garcia, will be loudly echoing our concerns about this MOU, followed up with a resounding no vote from you. My understanding is that you were an organizer for a long time before being in this position, while I am still very new to being politically involved. So I'd first like to recognize and express my respect for your experience and expertise. But I think it's that very experience and background that is confusing some of us who have been looking to you to use your platform and power to end police violence. I truly don't understand how or why you aren't fighting harder against the endless onslaught of actions by Phoenix PD, MCAO, and police that are determined to not only maintain the status quo, but to double down on the suppression of activists against police violence. You of all people must know this MOU is yet another act of violence against our communities. I just can't wrap my head around you really believing otherwise. What is keeping you from doing the right thing? Is plea threatening you personally? What do we have to do to get you to represent us? You must take the lead in rejecting this MOU in alignment with the values you claim to hold dear. Our next speaker is Hannah Heyman. Hannah, are you on the line? Hannah, I hope you your hearts line? are open today. Black and directly impacted communities have been telling you for years what they need to thrive in this city. We can all live and thrive here, but only if you open your hearts and give the community the resources we all need to build Phoenix into a city that is safe for Black communities. We cannot all thrive while the violent Phoenix Police Department gets over $745 million of the city budget, some 42% of the general fund. If you open your hearts and reject the hate from the police, we can have truly affordable housing for all, housing that is free for those who cannot afford it housing that is truly available to formerly incarcerated folks. We can have a city that is livable. People don't have to die in the summer heat. 
we have enough shelter for everyone in the city. We have enough resources to ensure every house has working electricity and air conditioning. We know that we only have a limited time left before the city is too hot to live in, before we all run out of water. We need to plan now for what will happen or the poor of, poorest of us will not survive. But none of this can be possible while the parasitic and violent Phoenix police get the majority of the budget. None of this can happen while the police here murder more black people than anywhere else in the country. The cops have been saying that they will be more accountable and transparent for years, all while they continue to be recognized as one of the most violent police forces in the nation. You could have begun to make them more accountable and transparent by negotiating this contract in public, but you refused. How can any of this be transparent or accountable when we had no say in the process, when you hid behind closed doors to promise the deadly Phoenix police hundreds of millions of dollars? Cops have proven time and time again that they cannot hold themselves accountable. That job is left to you, and it cannot be done by pouring more money into their already overflowing pockets. Please open your hearts and reject this contract. Please join us in imagining a future where everyone in the city is safe, where everyone has the resources they need not only to live, but thrive in this beautiful desert. Please vote no and join our future. Our next speaker is Ana Hernandez. Ana, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, my name is Anna Hernandez, and as somebody that has um, lost a family member to police violence, this contract is pretty offensive. Um, it, some of these financial concessions really make me feel like when you're negotiating with a toddler, you're offering them a toy or something to take a nap or to eat their vegetables. Uh, that's basically what we're doing here is we're giving money to the police to do the things that they're supposed to be doing, right? They should be in agreement with accountability and transparency without any financial compensation um, being received on their end. Um, it's just very offensive. It's very hurtful to us, the families that have experienced this um, without any oversight, without any consequences, without any repercussions to these officers that don't follow the letter of the law. Um, once again, you know, we're, we're, we're speaking about things that is common sense, should have been implemented a long time ago, and in no way is this being able to achieve any sort of reform when you continue to have officers that lie on the stand that are looking to use this as a political ploy just to get more money. Um, you know, we just saw all the reports that came out about county attorneys, officers lying to juries to charge protesters for exercising their First Amendment right and to see more money being allocated to this department that is grossly overfunded, in my opinion, is just a slap in the face to the residents of Phoenix. In addition, you know, wanting to give COVID relief money as pay bumps to these officers is is ridiculous when you have people of the city of Phoenix that are struggling to get by, are struggling to pay rent, are struggling to put food on their table, and are, you know, we're, we're scared to die at the hands of the police. So I urge all the council members to really listen to the community here and listen to what we're asking and vote no on this uh, MOU. Thank you. Our next speaker is Viri Hernandez. Viri, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. And thank you, Anna, for continuously coming and speaking. And, and this is what we're here again today. There is absolutely no accountability, no transparency within this, this contract. And it is disgusting that we have to continue to bribe this department for basic low level things that we should already expect from the, this department that is also costing us millions of hundreds of millions of dollars. Why the hell? Are we trying to bribe this department still, right? And in this process, other unions get screwed. It is another unions that we're against getting a raise. It is another unions that are killing our community members. It is plea, it is police, it is the Phoenix Police Department. And so when we're saying this, we're not talking about other unions, we're talking about the police association that continues to benefit from other unions and also continue to harm our communities. There's uh, uh, right now, it sounds like at least a 9%, but more than that percentage raise that is being 
that is part of their compensation plan. So I would like to know what is that total? How much money are we talking about additional? Are you all bribing this department with? How much is 9% plus that you all are offering? Also, the COVID, as Anna said, COVID relief money being used for this is gross. You all decided to not fund and provide COVID relief for immigrants last year. People that had DACA, LPR, U visas, asylum, you all decided not to fund our communities and you're deciding to use this COVID relief money to fund the bonuses for these cops that are not accountable, that are not transparent, not being a threatening, um, not creating, not, not giving us a threat, right? One of the concessions y'all mentioned, which is that they wouldn't go after people um, and, and put that threat out, that is, that is common sense. That is, there's nothing revolutionary about that. We're asking everyone to vote no on this budget. Um, I vote no. If you could please wrap up your comment. Um, uh, Mayor yeah, it was just that to vote no on this uh, comment, and I want to know how much money the nine percent is that y'all are offering. Mayor, members of the council, I want to clarify a couple things um, that Viri brought up. Uh, the first is that the uh, the labor contracts and all three of them today have the exact same language. They do not guarantee any amount of money from the American uh, Relief Act, whatever, uh, ARP, American Rescue Plan. It is not guaranteed. What the negotiated contract says is if the council determines that there should be under the ARPA funds for uh, premium pay for essential workers, if the council then there will be discussions with the unions. It does not guarantee anyone anything from the American Rescue Plan. So just want to be very specific on that. Ms. Hernandez also asked the value of, uh, of, of the compensation. Across the board for employees, 1% of compensation is calculated uh, across all city funds at $18 million of value. So nine times 18 is 162. Uh, so that's the that's um, that's the value of that of that raise, but that's across all all employees. That's not just police. I don't know that we have specifically the police amount. I'm sorry, Jeff. Thank you. So again, the nine percent is also across two years. So it's 162 million across two years and for uh, Mr. Bard just told me for police the amount for this year is 33 million for all police employees including civilians and next year would be 27 million dollars. Our next speaker is Chelsea Hickok. Chelsea are you on the line? Yes can you hear me? Yes please proceed. So this is a familiar spot for all of us to be in city council considering giving the bloated Phoenix Police Department more money so they can pretend to hold themselves accountable, which they've already failed to do even with this MOU, which was negotiated behind closed doors with no input from the public. Black and brown directly impacted community members have showed up to this space again and again telling you, proving to you that this uh, approach to reform doesn't work. You raised the budget for accountability and oversight last year too, and still the news and local activists are the only ones holding PPD accountable. How is giving the police more money to fail a good idea? The community does not want this. Councilwoman Laura Pastor, you blocked me on Instagram for calling out the hypocrisy of your Black History Month mural project as we watched you flitting around the city taking pictures with paintings of civil rights legends that we know you would have done nothing to help if they were fighting with the BLM movement today, as you continue to support the killing of black and brown Phoenicians by giving PPD free reign and an ever expanding budget. And here you are about to do it all again. You will hear us here if you don't want to listen online. We don't need your optical allyship. We need you to defund this violent and out of control police force. Say no to this MOU. I yield my time. Our next speaker is Kelly Kwok. Kelly, are you on the line? Kelly? Yes. Please proceed. Yes. 
Yes. How dare any of you claim to represent the people or claim to value respect, justice, or safety? The whole world knows PPD cannot be trusted because they are killo killer neo-Nazis who celebrate violence. But you all sit here and smile while supporting their bloody work. You have enabled these murderers in violence. Blood is on your hands now. And if you refuse to do the people's work, then you simply do not deserve your seat. We are organized and we vote. Vote now. Our next speaker is Benjamin Lewis. Benjamin, are you on the line? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir, please proceed. So there are a few problems with this MOU. The first, is that it was negotiated behind closed doors without community input, a fact that we learned today was always an option. And that cannot be clearer as the document is 56 pages of legalese that no community member could understand within the 24 hours of its posting yesterday. How are we supposed to provide input when we can't even understand what is in this thing? And I did read most of it, and I still have notes. The second problem is that this MOU makes it impossible for the city council or a civilian oversight committee to restructure the police department or terminate an employee, which is half of what we've been showing up week after week to demand accountability. And the third problem I have with this MOU is that it pays the police union to lobby our own state legislators. This has most recently resulted in a bill that criminalizes any form of protest which is unfortunately the only thing the department consistently responds to at all, and also unfortunately, the only thing they, ex uh, they respond exclusively with violence against, the community with. So um, we can't keep doing that. This MOU is a tacit permission from city council for Phoenix PD to continue with operating as is, despite all of the glaring failures of justice and service we've seen from the Phoenix PD. We are paying them. Why can't we reprimand them? Lastly, the Arizona justice system hasn't executed an Arizona resident since 2014, but Phoenix PD has killed one of our neighbors every two weeks for the past three years and counting. Something has to change, and this MOU doesn't give us any room to make that change as a community, and it has to be voted down. We cannot wait until 2023. While 50 more Phoenicians die at the hands of police, we need to vote this down today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tina Luna. Tina, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you. Yeah, I want to ask the council. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for uh, letting us comment. I really want to ask the council, who exactly are you representing? Based on your actions to date, it must be just comfortable, complacent white folks who will never be harmed by the police and apparently don't think there is a problem at all. And there's many of you on the council, staff, at work for the police who don't think that there's a problem. Well, I'm an old white lady who is very uncomfortable and I am not complacent with the current situation of the Phoenix police. Their violence uh, towards the black community, especially the indigenous and brown communities, it is just really outrageous. Giving them more money is not gonna solve this problem the first thing that needs to happen is people on city council need to actually acknowledge what is happening. You need to open your eyes. You need to look at the evidence, the facts that the Phoenix police is the deadliest in the nation. They are killing people continuously and getting away with it. They lie when they go to court in front of a judge. They conspire with attorneys to they trump up charges on protesters that are protesting their brutality, and it really, it really just needs to stop. And the police definitely don't need your protection. 
um, but the people being targeted, harassed, and killed by the police need your representation. I, we need you to do your job, take action on behalf of those who actually are impacted by these union agreements. Quit failing on us. Thank you. Our next speaker is April McHugh. April, are you on the line? We need more training. Mm -hmm. But I think if we actually start- Hi, I'm here. Please proceed. Um, I'm calling it. Thank you. And you can hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, we've been showing up week after week. The community has clearly been speaking um, out against the violence and the harm that PD and that our Phoenix PD inflicts on black, brown, indigenous, and poor people of our community. Yet these cries remain unanswered. And why? The only possible reason that you would vote yes on this MOU is if upholding systemic racism and supporting killer cops is your top priority. It is your job to work on behalf of your constituents' needs, but you sit here week after week and do nothing to save lives and stop the cycle. We see you, we're disgusted, yet we're not surprised. Please do not approve this MOU, I'm begging you. Thank you, I yield my time. Our next speaker is Amy Meglio. Amy, are you on the line? Oh, uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Um, so I'm here today uh, to speak in opposition to the MOU between the city of Phoenix and SWE. Um, first, I'd like to note that on a moral level, this must be rejected. Um, like BD said, we are here today not about unions and contracts in general, but about the police association. So I wanna remind everyone that ABC 15 recently exposed that Phoenix PD officers, including lieutenants, were congratulating each other for hurting protesters with neo-Nazi coins that they also auctioned and sold. I want everybody to take that in. They were congratulating each other for hurting protesters with neo-Nazi coins that they also auctioned and sold. So it was also revealed that as of 2017, after grand jury testimony, the city of Phoenix and Jerry Williams knew about this. They knew of the existence of the culture, they knew which officers had possessed the coins, and they allowed those officers to still work the streets and to work protests at that. How, after all of this, can the city of Phoenix in good conscience allow contract negotiations to continue to take place behind closed doors? We're talking about known white supremacist and known white supremacist culture. A vote for the MOU and plea as it stands is a vote against morality, against transparency, and for white supremacy. Um, second, there are children showing up at the youth budget hearing begging for a park and for maintenance for that park at 55th and Samantha in Levine. And I wanna elevate their request and like the police, they already get over half of the budget. No new money to the police, give these kids their park. Like they said, one young gentleman uh, said last night, it has been a rough year. And you know, there's so much better stuff that you could do for the community than over bloat these uh, the already over bloated police budget. Um, vote no, I yield my time. Our next speaker is Helen Mendidabal. Helen, are you on the line? I'm here, can you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am, please proceed. Hi everyone, um, it's really difficult to hear that if you guys have been holding closed door negotiations for 45 years, that's a long time and it really sounds like it's time for a change. And what's more surprising to hear that council has the power to bring these negotiations to open doors and to the community, make that change happen council, you guys have the power to do it. Um, I reject this MOU, $162 million, that money can go to our community, it can go to parks, it can go to schools. Um, the Phoenix police budget is already for uh, $745 million and no matter how much more money you give them, they're never gonna come close to being transparent or accountable for anything. Um, I know that for you guys, these comments just sound redundant and copy and pasted. I've heard complaints about that, but that's because our pleas, they continue to, to fall to deaf ears while you know our community continues to be murdered at the hands of Phoenix police. Um, I really hope that you guys really truly start representing the people and the community and if you guys do claim to value respect and justice and safety, 
make those actions match that instead of giving money to the police. They are already doing way too much with it, sending drones out to protesters. It's really terrifying to know what, what, what they do with this money. So I hope you guys find it in yourself to vote no for this. I yield the rest of my time. Our next speaker is Michael Newman. Michael, are you on the line? It does not appear as though Michael is on the line. So our next speaker is Karen Olson. Karen, are you on the line? Hi, I'm on the line. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Hi, thank you for your time. Um, I just want to let it be known that there are 53 public comments on agenda item 41. As I'm not always sure, there's a cutoff before meetings, um, you know, one hour before you can do public comments. And it's unclear whether or not council members get the chance to actually read through and acknowledge the names of these people that I personally keep on showing up and hearing the voices of my fellow community members. Council members, there are nine of you and at least 53 people are showing up today telling you that this is causing us harm, that this is painful to watch once again. This is at least the fifth time in my recollection of showing up to these meetings where you're giving police more money. We're asking you to reimagine, think of the community and how you can help us grow. Stop making us fear where we live. Let us grow out of this. It is painful to think that these voices keep getting sh show up time and time again. I want to just talk about my fellow community members. We matter just as much as each of your voices. We voted for you to represent us. And I challenge you to really think about if you are. Because I'm sitting here and there's emotion in my body. Are you feeling that? Do you? I invite you to take this opportunity because I have two minutes of your time. And I hope that you consider these people. Ava, Benjamin, Vanessa, AJ, Adam, Petra, Hannah, Mike. Deandra, Fatima, Esteban, April, uh, Chelsea, Ryan, Janelle, these are individuals that care. Please care. Vote no. Our next speaker is Jacob Rayford. Jacob, are you on the line? Yes, I am. That was very powerful. That was very powerful. Okay, you can go ahead and start me now. Like, again, my name is Jacob Rayford. I'm a civil rights advocate and a concerned member of the community. Now, before I share my thoughts on how performative this gesture from city is, as far as this year's uh, proposed MOU is concerned, um, I want to ask a related question directed both at city manager Ed Zerker and assistant city manager Jeff Bart. So again, it's related, so hands off me, buddy. Um, during yesterday's budget meeting, many of us who spoke regarding your vision of a crisis assistance program asked critical questions, some of which received responses uh, from either of you. One in particular, one particular question um, was noticeably unanswered. I asked both of you if uh, it's in your intent for your CAP program to report this problematic police department that's here before us today, um, or any um, other predatory agency such as ICE, uh, if you were to use uh, CAP as a means or a vehicle for, uh, to push towards carceral systems, and it was soundly ignored. This includes a follow-up question on Twitter to Zerker's account. Now, we know the police department is driven by prejudice and lack of accountability and the threat of using a humanitarian uh, department as a vehicle for a carceral system, like I said. One undoubtedly governed uh, through plea policies is alarming, and it's another reason why we can't trust the intention of today's MOU agreement. How many times are you guys going to um, make unilateral decisions and not seek engagement from a community? Uh, that wants a hand in its own development and well-being. This is the, the same department that saw Brit London go on the news last June and blame us for the removal of carotid chokeholds. And to paraphrase, it said something to the effect of they would have to resort to higher forms of de-escalation. Like, are you serious? These are who you guys are working behind closed doors with? These are, are, are who, you know, without our consent and knowledge, City Council, and to tie everything back together, we're talking about an agreement that was further funded and already bloated the police budget. Not only is this absolutely unnecessary, but that money could easily go towards no cap or your version of cap, uh, potential uh, departments that would remove calls and, and responsibilities that, that police and plea don't want. And 
Our next speaker is Marcus Reed. Marcus, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Okay. Hi, um, Ed Zerker and staff should be absolutely embarrassed by what they put forth here. The bank release hours of 1,859 hours of paid association release time needs to be decreased. It is symbolic of pleas need to spend significant time covering up detrimental behavior. The 500 hours paid for lobbyists to lobby against citizens' well-being needs to be removed. It is time to discontinue the narrative that police are not paid enough and introduce the truth that built environment, socioeconomic status, and access to healthy food and health care correlate to indicators, indicators of violence, poverty, and illness. The aforementioned are all issues you all have the power to address and fix. There is not strict language for police officers that propose or carry out violence in our city. Therefore, this MOU would actually further protect officers like those that threatened to kill the mayor or those that suffocated Mohammed Mohammed to death and the rest of the department that attempts to stop on First Amendment rights. The fact that witnesses talk to union representatives before any investigative capacity should alarm each of us. What other citizen gets to corroborate a story in the spirit of cover up and no accountability? This whole contract incentivizes deplorable behavior by those that we're told to trust. It empowers them to continue to display behavior that is not trustworthy. This contract is very symptomatic of a not, not listening to the cries of the public. The news stories uncovering deplorable behavior embodied by the whole department and the clink disregard to the health and well-being of the entire public. To utilize COVID funds that should be addressing health issues to pay a police's complete misallocation of funds. Your police department has not spent a single second intubating the sick, setting up iPads for loved ones to say goodbye to their family before being intubated or getting vaccines in arms. To steal COVID from some healthcare is absolutely gross. It is also disgusting to know that police culture is so morally corrupt to respond. Our next speaker is Harper Rowan. Harper, are you on the line? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you're a little soft, so if you could speak up a bit, please. Okay, um, I just wanna say that I think it's outrageous that the Phoenix Police Department is supposed to get paid for pandering to transparency and accountability. Police are getting more money for not threatening people who file complaints. They're getting more money for retaining a few types of discipline records. They have over $745 million. Any amount more is too much. And on top of that, accountability and transparency does not look like more money and changing language. It begins with listening to the people it is your job to represent, especially including the black and brown communities living in Phoenix. You know, the city and the people you're supposed to represent, or do you only represent white violence? Vote no on this. Our next speaker is Jessica Schmidt. Jessica, are you on the line? I am, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, please proceed. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm here to speak in opposition to the MOU. Thank you for this opportunity and for your time. Um, Phoenix Police Department is one of the most deadly police forces in the country. And how will more money resolve this disgusting issue? Black and brown people are continuing to suffer um, because the police apparently need to be bribed to do, to do their job correctly, which is to protect our rights and serve us. Increasing funding for white supremacist violence to reward people for doing the opposite of their jobs is also violence. As citizens, uh, you should be protecting us, supporting us, and to do so, you need to listen to us. It should be in your interest to hold city employees accountable to ensure they're doing their jobs. We have seen an entire investigative series that exposed the police department and the uh, Maricopa County Attorney's Office how they work together to politically persecute citizens exercising their constitutional rights. It revealed the existence of neo-Nazi coins that were given to police who are public safety employees and that the police chief knew about this. And you want to reward this by providing more money. This is violence. Please say no to this MOU and keep us safe. Um, I yield the rest of my time, thank you. Our next speaker is Sean Severud. Sean, are you on the line? Yes. Um, mayor and members of council, 
I just like to say this MOU must be rejected, full stop. Um, let's be clear, uh, this is an agreement with the racist police union. It's a document endorsing white supremacy, a document that continues to allow police to investigate themselves and avoid any real accountability and rewards them for allowing systemic racism and white supremacy to fester and grow within their ranks year over year. As proven recently, there are neo-Nazis in this department and the police chief and city manager knew and cho chose to do absolutely nothing about it. And now you wanna give them a raise for it. This wouldn't fly in any workplace. If your performance is abysmal, you don't get a raise. In fact, if it's egregious enough, you stand to lose your job. We have begun to take responsibilities away from the Phoenix PD, which is a small step in the right direction. Problem is that although we are removing responsibilities, we are trying to give them more of our dollars for doing less. As we shrink the footprint of this department, we must begin to shrink their bloated funding. The city manager and chief have shown zero willingness to hold their department accountable, which has created a department that has increasingly viewed the people of Phoenix, particularly black, brown, and indigenous, as threats instead of fellow residents and human beings. The city manager mentioned recently that the city is having difficulty finding any young Phoenicians to become Phoenix PD officers. I mean, are you surprised? Why would any black, brown, or indigenous young people want to be depart a part of a department that continues to view them not as human, but instead as threats to be contained and controlled so that the wealthy white residents of Sal and Jim's district can feel safe in their McMansions? This MOU is simply a document that allows plea and the council to pretend that they're making changes all while allowing police aggression towards the community to continue. So please take a moment to think about the history of this moment and vote no. Our next speaker is Courtney Tilly Bisbee. Courtney, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I'm on the line. Um, I just wanna let you know is that all the players currently in the Arizona criminal justice system, including you council members are part of the problem. You are about self-serving gains profit and power with no absolutely with absolute no accountability hiding behind closed doors to do your negotiating like cowards Arizona's budget and system should be about social justice fairness equality and humanitarian concerns how about some money towards education so we're not 50th in the United States Arizona is a state in desperate need of criminal justice reform starting with the Phoenix Police Department and its culture of abuse of power, corruption, and violence. All three branches of Arizona government are far from separate and equal, but rather complicit and work in concert with each other to promote and cover up a racist agenda and the notorious and murderous Phoenix Police Department. How about they get some budget by selling their militarized equipment, such as their tanks that they so proudly display on social media. I'm tired of my tax dollars going for court settlements for violence, abuse, and murder. Stand up, Mayor Kate, be brave, oppose this bill, enough is enough, stop being an accomplice with blood on your hands and on a reign of murdering and suffering. Our next speaker is LaToya Tolliver. LaToya, are you on the line? Fine. Uh, can can you right, hear thank me? Thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now, please proceed. All right. Phoenix PD and plea, un plea unions have been funded far above environmental infrastructure, community-based services by our tax dollars. Plea has some nerve to ask for extra funding when they have four open investigations against them. Phoenix PD has multiple civil rights complaints against them as well from the public and even within their own departments. Personally, I'm tired of watching officers drive around, just like she said previously, in brand new cars every year, and also in milita militarized tanks with militarized equipment complain about us when they are the ones invoking intimidation and violence. The truth is Phoenix PD and PLEA don't know how to do two things, handle their tax supported money they already received from us and protect and serve the public. Why can't we invest the surplus of 162 million of funds, especially the COVID relief into our homeless community, especially around the state capitol? I live near the state capitol and what I see over there is atrocious. Nobody should have to live that way. 
why not turn some of the empty air conditioned malls and buildings that we have that have air conditioning into reintegration or rehabilitation centers for the homeless? Why not invest in mental health for our community that has all been traumatized by the police department and services that take away the reasons behind criminal activity? Instead of supporting plea, can you support us? I oppose this MOU. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Venable. Elizabeth, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, please proceed. Okay, I wanted to say that um, true transparency and accountability is needed for the uh, Phoenix Police Department. It can't be monetarily incentivized. It's a culture, it is a practice, and white supremacy is embedded in those practices. We need real reform and penalties for police misconduct. The police budget is too large. It is disproportionate to, in comparison to surrounding cities. And um, resources for, for example, houseless people form a ridiculously low portion of the general fund budget whereas um, the uh, police department is the largest share of the uh, general fund department. Um, and it seems like we're giving the cops a cookie or a bribe to perform any form of accountability. And um, that's not appropriate. Also, I find it uh, Said that especially with the extremely low allocations from general funds um, towards housing that you would use COVID relief dollars to again fund the Phoenix Police Department. This MOU protects the power and privacy of the great of uh, the Phoenix Police Department and um, I would encourage those of you who are more likely to be inclined for police accountability to be courageous be brave and vote no, and then that's the end of my time. Our next speaker is Marty Winkler. Marty, are you on the line? I am. My name is Marty Winkler. I pose item 41. The conspiracy cover-up and corruption has to stop. By no means is this MOU a panacea and is unacceptable. No 5% pay raises for Phoenix police in a pandemic. And after all the Phoenix police protests, assaults, false arrests, cover up and corruption. Most of these reforms do little to stem corrupt, violent cops. They're already getting an average of 75,000 a year plus big overtime and off duty pay. Phoenix police and the city of Phoenix have been engaged in a conspiracy to falsely prosecute police violence and corruption dissenters with false crimes and felonies, charging them as a gang and other charges because they covered carried umbrellas. We need the DOJ immediately to come in and investigate Phoenix police conspiracy and corruption, which is systemic and extends to the top. Chief Jerry Williams, mm -hmm. where's the actual action for just unjustifiably assaulting and killing civilians and promptly firing ones like Officer Jeff Cook, Officer Je John Ferragamo, and other violent criminal Phoenix police. And Officer Jason Gillespie, Sunny Slope Substation, Desert Horizon Precinct, who almost killed me with his bare hands after I called to file a police report at a Circle K at 7th Street and Bethany Home after Leslie Nelson repeatedly tried to force me to buy a wrong lottery ticket. They actually now have J Jeff Cook and Jason Gillespie training new recruits, apparently training them to kill innocent people within two seconds, bludgeon unarmed hands up new grandmothers half to death, and how to manufacture a false narrative and feed that to the media and jury. These changes are peanuts in exchange for pay raises for corrupt, violent, and criminal Phoenix police. Most of the police department's internal affairs process and protections shield officers from accountability and remain in place. Our next speaker is Luke Black. Luke, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Please proceed. Council members Garcia, Pastor, Guardado, Gallego, Stark. This is what happens when the most violent police department in the country negotiates with other police behind closed doors. The police and the city manager are laughing at you. You do not have to accept this MOU. 
send it back, force your terms. Take a stand and actually fight for the people of this city. They are giving you nothing and they are laughing at you. We are going to pay them now to not lie and hide from us. The city has lost hundreds of millions of dollars in lawsuits to this department. And now we're gonna give them all $9,000 over two years without a single substantive change. The police are literally demanding that COVID support money be given to them. That's unacceptable and it's cruel. The special assignments unit, the death squad, is demanding a 5% raise from you. They are laughing at you. There are Nazis in this department. This department is lying to juries and targeting people exercising their First Amendment rights. The police are terrorizing our neighborhoods. None of that has been addressed in this MOU. The city manager and the police department are offering you garbage and they are laughing at you. This MOU is trash. Vote no. They brought you nothing. Do not sell out the people of this city for trash. Our next speaker is Rebecca Dennis. Rebecca, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Okay. Once again, it's disappointing that I, along with many others, find myself in the position to come before this council and ask that they dare to support more than the bare minimum when it comes to public safety and transparency. It's disheartening that our city manager and the city council lack the imagination, creativity, and compassion to believe that we deserve more as a community and society. It's been mentioned that no one on this council wants to defund Phoenix PD. I believe that's true. It would take immense bravery and courage to publicly admit that as our leaders in this city, you have not done your best to protect everyone and that this city has especially failed the black community and allowed for continuous harm in our black and brown communities. It would require that we re-examine the world as we have come to believe it, and I haven't seen that type of behavior from this council. There is greater risk in protecting the status quo than attempting to create a more just world, and I challenge this council to look beyond the now, beyond their limited scope, and towards the future. How sad that the city's idea of progress is essentially bribing the police department to be transparent. The fact that this transparency Clause as part of a citywide employee initiative is mind blowing as if our city officials and departments shouldn't have already been operating under these basic ethics of transparency. Real transparency would have been listening to the community members who have been asking for these MOU contract negotiations to be a public and community driven process as they should be. For that reason alone, among many other reasons, I oppose this MOU created behind closed doors. I would now like to read the names of, of people who lost their lives to police violence in March from 2014 to 2021. Michael C. Snedel, Stephen Hudak, William Thornton, Adam O'Neill Reinhardt, David Gardia, Eric Hamstrom, Raul Mirano Suarez Jr., Henry Wayne Rivera, Todd Munson, Craig Uran, William Neal Harden, Francisco Valdez, Kevin Robles, Please Jose Gonzalez. You Thank you. Our next speaker is Henry Gallardo. Henry, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Please proceed. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, uh, for me, a lot, a lot of the things on this uh, contract are problematic, but the one that stood out to me was that 0.5% raise for uh, signing out to the accountability and transparency proposal. To me, this sounds like a bribe. Uh, even if it's citywide, accountability should not be bought. And uh, especially with the track record Phoenix police have, um, this this raise creates uh, a choice also of, of being accountable or not. And that's a problem in itself. So I'm asking you to vote no on this contract and either impose your own or get rid of the raises and renegotiate in public and allow public comment. Also, Sal, I see your Facebook and your Twitter, and you're always hating on the defund movement, but you are actually one of the biggest allies to the defund movement because you're always voting no on budget stuff. However, you you did say you will support this MOU. Sir, please keep your even comments though you, to the item and uh, refrain from personal attacks, or we'll move to the next speaker. You said you were going to support this MOU. 
So I'm asking you to be consistent. You voted no on the previous MOU for the other union. So vote no for this one. Um, they're structured the same way. You said your problem with it was the way it's structured, but they're literally structured the same way. Stop with the blind loyalty to police. You're a hypocrite. Vote no, impose your own contract. Our next speaker is Lucy Liu. Lucy, are you on the line? It appears as though Lucy is not on the line. Our next speaker is Patricia Peglucia. Patricia, are you on the line? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Patricia, we can. Please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Members Stark, Garcia, Guardardo, Pastor, Williams, Nowakowski, and Mayor Kate. I speak in solidarity with Black and Brown leadership today. I know for all of you that believe in the myth of white goodness, it hurts and it's hard to believe that when we say these policies are white supremacists, we are not calling you mean names. We are actually stating facts. Your actions so far have not created solutions. They promote further harm. At this point, it's imperative that you all understand the power dynamics at play in our patriarchal and white supremacist system that does not value or respect black lives. We just heard a woman naming the names of police violence victims, folks murdered by our police department, and you cut them off. The results prove it. We see the police caging and killing black, brown, and indigenous folks with impunity. And we see where your values lie because you are meant to serve community needs. Therefore, you must vote with us today. No on this MOU. Council members Stark, Garcia, Guardardo, Pastor, Williams, Nowakowski, and Mayor Kate, I implore each of you to use the power your elected position affords you and vote no on this MOU. You must not give Phoenix police a pay increase when we have been begging you for years to defund the police, to divest from their violence, and to instead invest in healthy communities. I know it is hard for you to see the violence they commit because in your privilege, you would never experience but the fact remains, it is your job to use your power to help create community safety. The police will never do that. Putting money into communities will. In solidarity with Black and directly impacted leadership, we've been showing up demanding you support community health and safety by defunding PPD. And Ed and Jeff are here giving us the dollar amount breakdown. Please Any conclude your comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sushil Rao. Sushil, are you on the line? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, Sushil, yes, we can. Please proceed. Great, but are you listening? I didn't think so. There are currently multiple investigations and lawsuits on PPD. Efforts are being made by plea to push this contract through before the findings and rulings are made to hold them accountable. The way this contract is, the police department might as well incorporate. At least then you would all understand their obvious true values. To them, it's all about the money. You have made the most powerful, you have made them the most powerful entity in the city, almost the state. How much of this contract is nickel and diming more like thousands and millioning the people of Phoenix? Now, how much of it is willingness to be accountable to the law? How much of this agreement are concessions of dominance and power and accountability for known past criminal activity against the community? How can you say the community has input in this contract without the input of the OAT? I demand that this contract be tabled until after all the lawsuits and investigations are complete and their findings are made public. Maybe then plea and PPD will cooperate with ongoing investigations. Don't tell us you didn't know. Mayor, I believe that is the last speaker. Let me just check with our IT folks. And that was the last speaker on this item. I will close the public hearing. We will move to item uh, 42, the vote on the MOU. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yeah, I move approval of the MOU with plea. Second. 
We have a motion and a second. Council member comments, Council member Garcia. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you for everyone who, who spoke today. Um, we know that this contract in the past, uh, Phoenix Police, the plea contract has been used to protect officers even when they've been doing wrong. These contracts have created barriers that have made it almost impossible to hold police accountable and have rewarded police for in with increasing their benefits. There are some shifts being made with this new contract and I do wanna recognize those. Uh, there are some points that have been added that are a step in the right direction. It does, gives us, it does give a pathway to independent investigations. Uh, we, you know, as I said from the beginning, as we were looking into all or other forms of accountability, police should not be investigating themselves. Um, I do think that it was important um, for us to remove the piece of when someone files a complaint about an officer, uh, police can no longer intimidate them um, with these unnecessary warnings. Um, I do think it's good that there's 10 categories of discipline that will remain on the cops record uh, for the reminder, remainder of their employment. Uh, previously, those would be removed after five years. Um, it is good that there's better aspects to this contract that, that, don't, that do hold police accountable. Um, but like a lot of the speakers said, we're incentivizing officers for real transparency by giving them a bonus to do it. I don't think that's the right way forward. Uh, police are a different type of city employee, and I think that's a collab that's a conversation we need to have and understand um, that there is intricacies and differences between all our units and and we should again be sophisticated enough to have the conversation for each one. Um, they're the only city employees with an association who have the legal ability to kill another human be being while on the job. And we've seen it happen numerous times, along with other assaults and, and other forms of harm to the community. There should be a higher level of responsibility with higher standards of accountability and transparency for the police department unequivocally. We should not be held up in trying to make or assume that that's equity, that we're holding all these uh, units accountable in a similar way. I do think police needs to be held to a different standard, both because of the responsibilities they have and what they've shown us in the past years with their actions. Um, all workers should have a say in their workplace, but no one should be able to negotiate the ability to inflict harm on others with little to no consequences. This contract includes a 1.5 pay raise that will jump to 2% for police if they agree on the city's transparency and accountability proposals, plus bonus potential pay, premium pay from the American Rescue Plan Act, money that is supposed to go to those most impacted by COVID-19. Whatever happens with this vote today, I, I don't know how else to ask my colleagues, but please let's figure out to get this money to the folks that most need it and most have been act, impacted by COVID-19. Accountability should not be on the negotiating table in the first place. An officer should need, should not need an incentive to do what they should be doing. Um, and these shifts should have happened a long time ago. COVID-19 again has shown us that safety goes far beyond armed officers roaming our streets. We should start prioritizing money to other departments and, and other programs that have historically been underfunded. And with that, I am going to be voting no on this contract, and I hope others join me. Thank you. Mayor. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor. I want to thank um, PLEA for all the work they've done in the past year, much like uh, Local 777. Um, they have been out there patrolling and protecting us especially during this uh, pandemic. And I know a lot of them probably wish they could be at home with their families, but their job is to serve and protect the public. And so I will be supporting this MOU. Thank you.
Mayor? Councilman DeCeci. I too will be supporting this. This is a time for the entire city to see what the city of Phoenix stands for. Do we support the anti-police defund police movement or do we support those that protect us? Are we going to protect those that protect us? This is the time you put away your ideological and political differences and support those individuals that have been protecting us. We've seen our police department vilified, attacked. We've seen their families attacked in this past year from these individuals that I consider to be nothing but a bunch of crazies. They turned out to be nothing but a bunch of haters and they're racist to boot on top of that. That's exactly what we've heard today. We've heard nothing but a bunch of verbiage and, and anger from these haters and these racists that have been attacking our police department. So last year, I promised I would work for and I would support a pay raise for our police department. And I promised them, and you've heard this in I think at least the last three meetings, that I put that there. And we're going to see what happens today, whether I end up keeping my end of the bargain and supporting the promise that these police departments, that the police department and individual police officers deserve a pay raise, deserve a lot more than this. And I want to make sure it's on the record. When you include the merit and longevity, which are pay raises and um, uh, bonuses that are given, along with the 5%, we're going to be looking at a minimum of 8% to possibly 9% increase this year and another 8 to 9% increase next year. The merit and longevity are built into the contracts, not only this one, but others. So these contracts are all very similar. But I'll tell you right now, this city, we're going to see who supports our police department and who is going to stick their head out and come out and say, I support these individuals. I do not support those that have been attacking and vilifying their families and these police officers that have been working hard on our behalf. So I'm going to be supporting this and I'm going to be supporting the fire contract as well because they are the next in line that's going to be attacked. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I'm committed to making sure we have the best department possible. This contract is an important step towards accountability and transparency, and I am planning to support it. Any additional council member comments before we vote? Roll call. Cecilio. Strong, yes. Garcia. No. Guardado. Mayor, can I explain my vote? Please do. Thank you. So like our other units, I appreciate the difficult jobs of our officers. However, the silence of plea as an organization over my past two years on council has been defining. I understand the blackout period during negotiations, but this has gone on for much longer than that. We have asked to work as a collective to better our community. We have spent countless hours discussing accountability, transparency, and modernizing our police force. I have sat across the table with our chief, from our community action officers, from the sergeants and lieutenants associations, and members of our community. Overall, the safety of our officers and civilians is of the utmost importance. But until plea is ready to sit at the table and have these difficult discussions, I cannot support this MOU. Um, thank you, Mayor, and I am going to be voting no. Nowakowski. Yes. Thank you. Pastor. I would like to make some comments. And uh, I do feel I. I, I do feel like plea needs to come to the table. Um, I did earlier on have uh, with past presidents, did speak, met with them often and did speak uh, to the plea members. Uh, I'm not sure where that shifted or changed, um, but I do feel like there needs to be uh, some dialogue and, and transparency. Um, they are, we do have our officers that are out in the streets and protecting our community. And uh, they also need support in the sense of uh, understanding 
of our wellness program, also understanding our implicit bias program, and, and, and provide them with all the tools that are needed within our community. So in this contract, and it's not in particular, uh, in this contract, there are certain standards, higher standards that are held with the position that they are in. Uh, same way that uh, depending on the position you, you hold in, in city government, uh, there are certain standards that, uh, higher standards that are uh, you're held accountable for. And so I struggle with the contract in the sense that there are other units that are, are very different, uh, civilian units that are very different, that we are asking for language or having them uh, place language in a contract uh, that is very, very higher standard than what their position is. Um, I feel like equity can be developed and uh, administered in, in contracts and fairness all the way across the board, and equity can be achieved uh, with different language, but the process is the same as to what happens in the contract. Um, I will be voting yes on this contract, but my message is really towards the city manager regarding all the other units. Thank you. Stark? Yes. Waring? Oh uh, yeah, I'd like to explain my vote there. Uh, so I, well, thank you. I am uh, voting for this solely to give the officers an appropriate raise. Uh, frankly, I think it should be more. I don't think we should be treating all employees of the same given the level of responsibility and the um, uh, the nature of the job, we'll just say that, because yes, you can take a life doing this job, you can also get killed doing this job with some alarming frequency. Um, you know, we tried to do this uh, once before, I believe it was in the contract of 2014 and did not succeed. I have issues with some of the things with the structuring of the contract, but I also think that this is an appropriate time to produce a raise for officers who are frankly, frankly been more put upon than ever. And you heard some of that today. So these are tough jobs. It is tough to recruit. I think it would be foolish to undersell the importance of the job and to try to not pay them a going wage when we've just talked about how important what they do is and the nature of the job being so important and potentially so deadly on both sides. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak, Mayor. I'm gonna be voting yes. And I think that's the appropriate vote at this juncture. Thank you. Williams. Mayor, on behalf of my district and the city as a whole, I support this and support the police officers. Diego. Yes. Passes seven, two. We next move to item 43, public comment on proposed MOU between the City of Phoenix and Phoenix Firefighters Association, Local 493. We will begin with a staff report. Welcome, Director Bays. Thank you, Mayor. And Mayor, members of the Council, similar to the previous presentations, the purpose of today's item is for the Council to have an opportunity to hear public comment on the proposed contract between the City and the International Association of Firefighters, Local 493 representing bargaining unit five. With me today is David Matthews, assistant HR director and lead negotiator for the city with our fire union. As you recall, uh, we, begin, we began negotiations earlier this year and we've reached an agreement which I will summarize now. So again, the highlights that I'll go through are the accountability and transparency components of the agreement, some other notable changes as well as the compensation proposal. So with our um, Fire Local 493, we have agreed to clarifying language regarding the official HR file. No discipline may be removed and serious discipline may never be inactivated. We've also agreed uh, that serious discipline should be considered for compounding discipline purposes, promotions and transfers throughout the employee's career. And that 
a mutually agreed upon representative should serve on the committee in lieu of the fire union representative. And we've agreed to standardized investigation protocols. Finally, an additional notable uh, addition to the contract is that it allows for training schedule enhancements, which accommodates department-sponsored training, which is a benefit both to our employees and to the department. The compensation agreement is, again, consistent with the other labor groups in year one, an ongoing 1.5% of total compensation, plus a non-continuous 2.5% payment of total compensation. The additional half percent ongoing and half percent non-continuous of total compensation was added for agreeing to those accountability and transparency proposals that I described. And in year two, again, an ongoing one and a half percent of total compensation and 2.5 percent non-continuous payment of total compensation, both similar to the other groups. We've also agreed to the same uh, consideration language regarding the American Rescue Plan Act, which allows for consideration of Unit 5 in the Council's deliberations about the ARPA funding. And finally, we have also agreed to a fairness agreement with Unit 5, which allows um, them to receive any subsequent increase in compensation that other groups may receive. And we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Mayor, if I could also just to conclude on this item, I want to take a minute and just thank uh, our HR staff, Lori, led by Lori Bays. Uh, lead negotiators included David Matthews, Janice Pitts, Xavier Frost, and Ashley. Ashley. Last name, I'm sorry. Oh, Pritchett. I'm Ashley sorry. Pritchett. I just didn't enunciate. Thank you. And I'm sorry, my name recollection there. I think it's important to note that the city of Phoenix is rather unique in, at least in Maricopa County, but certainly relative to the state government of Arizona and Maricopa County, in that we have a, an ordinance that requires a labor negotiation process with unions. That means that we are required to sit down across the table as equals management and unions to fairly negotiate agreements. And I think what we see today is a great example of what happens under the city's labor negotiation ordinance. I want to commend also, in addition to our staff, I want to thank uh, Jennifer Grundle in Unit 1, Britt London, and Steve Berline. They came in. They negotiated hard on behalf of their employees that they represent. We negotiated hard as management, and we walked out at the end with negotiated uh, agreements that both sides didn't get everything they wanted but uh, got what was in the best interest, we believe, of the city and of the employees. I know it doesn't always feel that way, and it's not sometimes reflected in the comments we hear, but that is what happens in a union negotiation environment, and I want to thank our staff for living up to that. I want to thank these three unions today for the work that they've done, and especially want to thank Mayor Yu and the full city council for your patience as we've gone through this process and brought this to you today. So, thank you. Thank you and well said. Negotiations are a complicated process. Not everyone, no one gets everything they want, but we are moving the city forward. Um, with that, I will open a public hearing and we will welcome uh, Steve Berline to provide comments. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on with my camera, but. Um, I'd, I'd like to start by uh, mayor and council, uh, city manager and staff, uh, another tough year of, of negotiations. Um, I had an intention, I thought I signed up to speak on items 41 and 42, uh, the, the plea contract. And there's a lot of testimony and, and um, a lot of emotion in that testimony. But what I wanted to speak on is, you know, as firefighters, I'm the president of the United Phoenix Firefighters Association. We are protecting the city side by side with their brothers and sisters who put on the uniform of the Phoenix Police Department uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all across the valley. And the thousands of acts of kindness and caring that we witness from our police officers day in and day out. It's, it's a shame that good news doesn't sell or we would be seeing more body cam footage 
of the great things they do for our community. And I work downtown and, and there's a, a large homeless community and um, it's, it's, it's almost emotional when you see the acts of kindness and caring that our police officers provide to that community. So um, I'm gonna try and stay uh, within my two minutes. I also wanted to acknowledge Vice Mayor Williams and Councilman uh, Michael Nowakowski uh, between the two of you. I think it's around 45 years of uh, service on the council as vice mayor and as interim mayor. And um, you two never wavered from your, your commitment and your dedicated support to not just the firefighters, but a police officer, public safety. So I wanted to thank you. I know this is your last uh, contract. So thank you for that. Um, I'm asking all mayor and council to support this agreement that we've come to. Uh, firefighters begin our team negotiation, uh, negotiations 10, 10 months ago, we put our team together. We literally have thousands of hours invested uh, to get to where we are today. And I know the city has a, the same, and um, if you can please find it uh, in you to uh, support this agreement, we sure would appreciate it. Be safe and have a great day. Thank you. And on behalf of the council, please thank our firefighters for their service. Uh, we will close the public hearing, hearing and move to item 44. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? I would move to approve the MOU between firefighters and the city of Phoenix. Second. I'll second that. We'll recognize Councilman Michael Nowakowski, our public safety chairman for the, the second. Um, with knowing full enthusiasm from Councilwoman Stark for the item as well. Uh, council member comments. Mayor. Mayor. Let's see. We'll go Councilwoman Stark. Okay, thank you. Again, um, I want to thank our firefighters for all the work they've done, especially during the pandemic. They're on the front lines and they've done such great work. I know many firefighters did um, contract the coronavirus, and um, but they but they're so loyal to trying to serve our public. They need to be recognized for all the good work they do, and I'm very happy to support this contract. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll go, uh, I think I heard Councilwoman Pastor next. Is that right? No? Sure. <laughs> okay, it was either you or, Council or the Vice Mayor. <laughs> Sorry, it was Sorry. the Vice Mayor. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Okay, it was the Vice Mayor. It's hard to tell us apart sometimes. I'm so sorry. No, I just want to thank the firefighters. They are always there when needed. They take great risk in their job, and I fully believe in the job they do, and they have saved so many lives. And during COVID, I know how that the membership really suffered. So many caught it, uh, but they went to work as soon as they could and took as little time off and manned every shift. So thank you, all five mayors. Thank you, Vice Mayor. We'll go to Councilman Nowakowski, followed by Councilwoman Guardado. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, I just really want to thank, um, as the Chair of Public Safety, both um, Brad and Steve for all those men and women that put on that uniform to save lives on a daily basis. And, you know, we started about five years ago, a Star Spangled celebration and remembering all those fallen police officers and firefighters that given the ultimate sacrifice of their lives. And it was um, a celebration where we were able to tell their stories of those individuals that have passed away. And it was just incredible how the community united and listened to the stories of the firefighters and police officers that have passed away, that they were youth group leaders, they were coaches, they were involved in the community. And um, it's just incredible when we tell that story how it connects people and brings people together. So I just really wanna thank both the firefighters and the police officers. We have 500 square miles of city that they have to cover and that's a lot of territory. And when we need somebody to be saved, you guys are always there to help out. So thank you and good luck. Thank you, Councilwoman Gordado. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I also wanna thank um, thank Steve Berlein and thank Chief Tara for all of their work that they have done. It's been a, it's been a very tough year for all of them. Um, it's they're they've been on the front lines. They've done so much for our constituents, answering to all the calls. It's been, 
a very tough year. I'm excited to see um, that we were able to get to a, an amazing contract for them and I'm very excited um, to be able to vote on this on this contract. Um, they deserve every every single thing that they are getting out of this contract. They're on the front lines. They, them and their families um, sacrifice a lot to be able to do what they do on a, on a daily basis. I know that I have a, a 10 year old at home that one day wants to be a firefighter. So definitely excited to be able to support them on this contract. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Pastor, do you wish to? Yes, thank you. Um, I just like to thank uh, Steve Berline and uh, all the men and women uh, firefighters I have worked very closely with you in many different uh, projects. Most recently where I have uh, worked with uh, firefighters is with the COVID ban and uh, providing the services uh, with the COVID ban. In addition to that, this past weekend, um, and I, I will be advocating for this, I'll be, uh, people will be caught off guard. Uh, this weekend, I was at a vaccine um, site and uh, was there with some of the fire, uh, some of the firefighters were there helping. And so got in a big uh, dialogue and what we were talking about were baby shots and flu shots. And so I will put it out there right now that I will be advocating for more baby shots and flu shots that they administer throughout the uh, whole year and uh, push for support for them. And so uh, just wanna thank you uh, for all the work you do. Uh, uh, they were there at a time of uh, need and place where where we needed them and uh, really appreciate and saw them in action and appreciate the work that they do. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. I don't think anyone who knows you would be surprised you're advocating for more health care for children. Uh, Councilman DeCicio. Thank you, Mayor. I want to thank Steve and your entire team. You've done an exemplary job this past year. I'm going to be supporting your contract. This is a time that we need to band together and work together. The wackos that you heard in the previous presentation attacking our police department will soon be coming after you. I'm telling you that right now. Right now, they, they are looking at a divide and conquer mentality and they will come after you next. So we need to work together. We need to continually do this together and find a way to protect our city and our citizens. And I do wanna make sure that your entire team, all your firefighters on front line, understand that we appreciate you and we love you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Would hope that we can uh, focus on the issues and not calling names. Um, any additional comments? Council Member Garcia. You mean like neo, you mean like neo-Nazi? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, bile. You mean um, the attacks on the police department? Did, I didn't hear you say Steve. that about them, Mayor. I heard you say that about mine when, I, when, the when I'm defending the police department. No, if you're going to use an attack on the police you better defend yourself across the board. Well, too bad. I do too. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah. Okay. So, Steve, thank you so you're much. You're never going to shut me down like that. You're never going to shut me down. Just remember that. You're never going to do that. Member Garcia you can has the floor. Our police officers. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, just I think echoing what a lot of folks said about the fire department with the vaccine events, the testing events, um, the amount of calls that went up for respiratory services were huge, and folks were, were taking a risk having to tend to these calls. Uh, knowing that someone might have COVID was something um, uh, really brave. And, and I'm excited that the, the fire department folks are being recognized for what they've done. They're getting this raise. And, and I think moving forward, excited to look in on, on how else we can support their work, make sure that they have the PPEs um, that are ready. There's going to be some great improvements to technology um, that I'm really excited around with the fire department. So. Thank you all for all your work, and I'm glad we got this contract done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your hard work on this contract. Roll call. Cecilia. Strong.
one yes. Thank you. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Castor. Yes. Dark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9 0. Thank you. That concludes our items related to employee MOUs. Appreciate everyone who worked hard on these items. We next move to item 46 amendments in the classification ordinance related to communications operators and dispatchers. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? I would move approval. Second. Second. <laughs> a lot of people are working very hard on this one. We have a motion uh, and a second. Council member comments. Councilwoman Guardado. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, that, that was a lot of dedication. Um, so in our, in our public safety and justice subcommittee, we have heard about the wait times our residents have experienced with the 911 operators. We have also focused on the challenging work conditions our operators are experiencing because of chronic understaffing. I believe that today's item is a key first step in addressing the issues that affect our residents and our 911 operators. I am hopeful that the races we approve today will improve recruitment and retention issues have seen. More will be needed to resolve and improve our city services, and we know that operators are still understaffed, but I am optimistic that today is a step in the right direction that supports both our employees and our residents. Also, we, we did a meeting um, this week um, with Lori and with, and with Chief Williams and with, and with Aspatia. We talked about different ideas to be able to help with recruitment and how do we deal with some of these, some of these issues. Um, we're gonna also going to be taking tour of the facility to see what are some of the things that we can actually improve on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm very excited to be able to support this today. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Additional comments from members of the body? Yeah. Councilwoman Pastor. Okay. Um, this has been in the works for, I want to say, two to two and a half years uh, for fire and police 911 operators. Uh, when I started to uh, work with the 911 operators, uh, what I discovered. Uh, two years ago, two and a half, was that uh, the stress level that they were on, that they had during, in taking a call. And as we talked about additional operators and, and recruitment, we also talked about their wellness and their well-being, uh, especially when they had, have to go on to another call immediately after one, one right after another. And so I was uh, fortunate enough to work with work with them in uh, redesigning their wellness room and uh, be able to go in there and uh, decompress. And then also I was able to work with our, uh, I call it, uh, I call it the, our PTSD training uh, that is offered to our firefighters and our police officers. And now we have included the 911 operators. So I'm really proud of that work. And so I'm glad we're stepping forward. And uh, we do know we need uh, really uh, strategic recruitment and marketing. Uh, it is a stressful job if you think about the calls that they receive and how they uh, work an eight hour shift. So um, after call after call. So I'm excited to, uh, to be able to vote on this. And I'm excited for all my colleagues that have worked on this. Thank you, Councilwoman Stark. Yes, I, I'm very supportive of this. I, I, I agree with uh, Councilwoman Pastor. It's a very stressful job. I, I don't know how they do it call after call. I remember several years ago, I had to make a 911 call and I was panicking. I, I could think straight and the person on the other side kept me calm. We worked through it. I don't know how they do the job they do, but they certainly deserve compensation for it. So I am happy to see this on our agenda. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. 
Council Mayor. Roll call. Councilman DeCicio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I too am going to be supporting this. The 911 operators deserve a raise after what they've been through. They are shorthanded. Uh, we definitely need to have more of the there protecting our public, and at the same time, we need to be able to compensate them for the work that they they do do. The we I'm waiting to hear back to see what the physical uh, conditions are in our operators room and in the other areas that they operate in, because I know it's been pretty bad. I'm looking forward to coming up with a solution on that. And I do want to thank Laura, Michael Nowakowski, and others that worked on this to get it through. Thank you, Mayor. Yes. Thank you. Any final comments? Thanks to all who, who worked for this for quite a while. Roll call. Pasicio. Thank you, and yes. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Gallego? Yes. This is 9-0. Thank you. We next move to item 48, which is the multi-city uh, shrug operating charge rates for fiscal year 2022. Will the city clerk please read the title? Item 48 is for ordinance number G6833, an ordinance amending chapter 28 of the Phoenix City Code by amending section 28-39A4 pertaining to sewer user billing rates to sub-regional operating group SROG member cities and providing for an effective date of July 1st, 2021. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor, will you please do have a motion? Second. We have a motion a second and certainly fitting for the vice mayor to make this motion. She has been working so hard on regional water issues. Any council member comments? Roll call. Oh, Mayor, may I make, ask a question? Yes, please, Councilman Waring. Thanks. Uh, so probably just for Ed. Um, Ed, to, to people just reading this or looking at this home, it might look like some sort of water rate increase, but it's actually sort of a balance of trade, I guess I'd say, between us and other cities. Is that a fair assessment? Mayor Councilman Waring, I'll actually uh, have our brand new water services director, Troy Hayes, answer that question. Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman Waring, yes, this is the fees associated with treating wastewater from the other valley cities and so those are calculated on the actual cost that we think we're going to incur over this next year based on their flow and loadings that they're going to be sending to the city and then uh, passed on to those cities so this is a fee for service fee for service yes uh, thank you troy any additional comments or questions roll call Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. We next move to item 60, which is the Phoenix Public Library phase reopening plan for in-building visits. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. We have one member, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I will recognize um, our acting deputy city manager, John Chan, and our city librarian, Rita Hamilton, for a brief introduction of this item. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. As you know, the Phoenix Public Library System has been, uh, facilities have been closed to the public for the past year, but during that time, uh, the library department staff has found innovative ways to continue to provide excellent service to the community uh, with uh, providing things such as uh, curbside services and uh, Wi-Fi in, in the parking lot for people that don't have access to uh, uh, internet and at this time, the uh, staff is prepared to uh, recommend a limited phased reopening of library facilities 
uh, our city librarian, Rita Hamilton, is, is here with me, and she will uh, quickly run through the, the uh, branches that are proposed to be opened in phases, along with the services that will be provided, uh, including ongoing uh, services such as the curbside services. And then she'll uh, also talk about some of the COVID-19 safety protocols that will be uh, incorporated into the reopening plan. Uh, these protocols were reviewed by the city's uh, public health advisors. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Rita. Thank you, John. I'm pleased to be here to this afternoon to share with you some brief highlights of our outline for restoring in-building visits to library locations. I'll give you a short overview of the services we'll be providing, where we will be providing them, and the safety measures we have in place. In recent months, the library has increased our focus on defining a strategy to restore in-building visits, allowing customers access to select library services inside our facilities. Mondays through Saturdays, current curbside service will continue every morning, 9.30 a.m. to noon, with 30 minutes scheduled to break down curbside and prepare for the afternoon. Each facility offering in-building visits will be limit, limited to 25% of the permitted public space's occupancy level. As transmission rates decrease, our occupancy level will increase. In-building visits will be offered through 45-minute reservations from 12.30 to 5.30, and library customers can use a computer or the internet, browse our collections, use a printer, scanner, or copier, pick up holds, check out materials with self-service kiosks, and check out laptops with Wi-Fi hotspots. All in-building visits will require a 45-minute reservation allowing for each facility to be cleared for 15 minutes of cleaning. Customers may make an advanced reservation up to three days prior in English or Spanish on the library's website or by calling the library's call center. The advanced reservation system will allow an individual to make a reservation for parties up to four people, for example, a parent with children. Drop-in customers may request a reservation at the door as they are available. Each facility's occupancy allowance will have designated number dedicated to accommodate the drop-in customers. Restoration of in-building visits will roll out in three separate library locations groupings. The first group selection is driven primarily by providing geographic coverage throughout Phoenix at larger li library locations and their computer usage and circulation volume. Group one will go into effect on Monday, April 19th, followed by library locations in group two on Monday, May 3rd, and finally with group three on Monday, May 17th. Library groups two and three will continue with the current curbside service and hours Monday through Saturday until they transition to the in-building visit service model. At this time, our South Mountain Community Library remains closed to all services as it is part of the South Mountain Community College campus, which is closed. We have put in place safety measures which were recommended by the city's health advisors. They include face coverings and social distancing will be required at all times. Customers' temperature will be checked with a contactless temperature check and will be expected to reschedule their appointments if they are experiencing COVID-like symptoms. Health shields have been installed at service desks and the computer stations. Disinfectant wipes, hand sanitizer, and disposable masks will be readily available for customers. Regular cleaning and disinfection of common surfaces, computer workstations, and the restrooms will take place. Again, these measures were recommended by the city's health advisors to help people keep people safe. Thank you. I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, we do have one member of the public to address the council. We'll, so we'll begin with that. Uh, Dave Jenkins, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mayor. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Dave Brian Jenkins. I'm in support of reopening the public libraries. With the Mayor and the Council Members restating mask wearing in public places, 
the great resource of the political libraries could be open safely, could be reopened safely. Thank you for listening to the science and putting public safety first. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank our entire time, uh, our entire team at the Phoenix Libraries for their innovation during COVID, whether it was coming up with a great curbside service system or the work they did turning the makerspace into a resource for our healthcare workers, including making sure their PPE could uh, operate more effectively. Also very appreciative of, of some of the different to-go kits and, and other innovations and the way folks from our library stepped up with other city initiatives, including COVID-19 testing. Uh, with that, council member comments or questions? Mayor, may I say something? Uh, Councilman Waring. Thank you. Uh, Rita, thank you for meeting with me and going over the plan. I appreciate the changes uh, that you made at my suggestion. I appreciate that very much. Uh, I would say that I think we need to move as quickly as possible to get the libraries completely reopened. Uh, frankly, you know, I grew up libraries going with my mom and so forth. And if the library was like the library was back in the 80s, uh, sans the computers, I, I would argue we should be completely open now. That is the, the area where I would have the most concern, anybody who's been in our libraries. And I know I've discussed this with Ed. I, I think you and I also discussed this. I haven't seen it, of course, but it sounds like you've got plastic shields both behind the computers and next to the computers. And you're going to space that out, but obviously that's an area where people are facing each other. They're right next to each other by definition, the way the setup is. Um, but I, I definitely think, you know, as Arizona moves, uh, as cases continue to drop, we could very quickly find ourselves with 50% with capacity, correct? And you're still going to have the curbside going on. Is that accurate? Yes, Councilman, that is accurate. Yeah. So. I just everything else in Arizona really is, is really opening up uh, other places are taking temperatures and so forth that I've been. So you do see that that's not that atypical and uh, the appointment process is a good way of getting around. Um, uh, you know, over overcrowding, but uh, I think pretty quickly if people are there to browse the stats. You know, a lot of these are pretty big facilities. And I do have concerns. Uh, Mesquite Library is not in my district, it's in Deb's district, but it's on the border of our district. I believe, I assume it's still true pre obviously COVID that it is the second busiest library after Burton Barr. Is that still an accurate statement, Rita? Yes, Councilman, you're correct. Yeah. So I'm just afraid that, you know, not all libraries, frankly, are considered uh, created equal in terms of usage. You know, I've been to a lot of our libraries. I don't know if I've been to all of them, but I've been to a lot of libraries around the city. And, you know, some middle of the day, it's not that busy. And, uh, but Mesquite, it's almost always busy. And so there is going to be, by having the same percentage, even though they're not always the same square footage, uh, Mesquite, for example, is much bigger. I've got to believe, I don't know what the square footage is, but, but then Highland, which is at the 51, uh, you know, about, uh, well, uh, 51 and Highland, I think it's like 16th Street over there, the cross street or 20th Street. Um, you know, that one's pretty small, uh, but it also doesn't get nearly the use. So I'm just a little afraid that the people in North Phoenix who flock to Mesquite, you know, aren't going to get in at the same rate as they might, or are going to have more of a wait than they will at other places. So. I understand the the easing back into it, but I also would hope that we would very quickly transition. I think other cities are doing the same. And uh, I would also hope though that we would keep uh, as much as is practical, the uh, uh, drive up service. You know, I've used that myself. Uh, obviously we're all using it now, but I've used it. And uh, it seems to work pretty well. I've had good feedback from constituents. Your staff was very efficient. Frankly, people like the early morning hours. You know, uh, the curbside was open earlier than the library normally would have been open. And that, that works for a lot of people too. So the more we can have that, I understand there are staffing issues involved. The more that we can keep that, of course, if you've already gone to pick up your books at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., you don't need to go to the library and take up a space at a library that's as busy as Mesquite. So I just want to make sure, you know, those, those thoughts were out there. Um, I don't know if I'm speaking for residents, but I, I'm guessing that that's feedback because I'm a customer too. I'm guessing that's feedback that probably represents 
the views of at least some of the people who are traveling to those libraries, uh, particularly the busy ones like Mesqui. And I uh, appreciate your efforts and, and please uh, let us know what we can do to help because libraries are important. Here. Councilman DeCicio. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as the rest of the state is opening up, as Jim said, we're still lagging quite a bit. This is a very small step, but it is a step forward. I wish we would be able to be a little bit more bold and to be able to accommodate the public. You know, a big part of going to the library is browsing books. That's where you learn. That's where you learn about different authors. Going and having an appointment sounds great for those of us that are well off, but for those that would love to just be able to sit in the library and look at it and look at the different books and look at the different pieces of art that they're, because each of those authors have created art. We have really not done a disservice to those individuals that would like to be able to do that. So from my end, this is a small step, a very small step, but it is a step forward. I'm gonna be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, uh, Councilman. Thank you, Council Member Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm excited we're looking on, on how to reopen. I, I do think we should err on the side of caution, but we'll be voting yes. We did have one concern in our office regarding uh, the temporary one bag policy. Um, just kind of had the question of how that mitigates COVID spread. What I want to make sure that doesn't happen is that this rules kind of adversely use uh, or impact folks uh, without shelter that might have to have more belongings with them. And so that's the one concern we had, but you know, glad we're moving to opening it and, and glad we're, we're doing it in this cautious way. So just a question Thanks. about the one, one bag policy for staff. Mayor, Councilman. Yeah. Um, we we can take another look at that, that is for sure. Um, we were just trying to make it easy to clear the building for the cleaning in between. So we can test out doing with just one bag for the early stages. And then if we think we can accommodate other bags coming in as well, we can certainly do that. Thank you. I just wouldn't want folks that, that need the service or would want to go in there and they have two bags on them. Um, we just appreciate some some discretion and, and some, I guess, some, yeah, just trying to make sure that, that folks aren't discriminated on. So thank you. Councilman understood. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call. Tasicio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Nowakowski. Yes. Thank you. Pastor. Yes. Dark. Yes. Waring. Uh, yeah, Mayor, just one slight comment. Sal is spot on about the browsing. Um, that, that is an important component of libraries. It's something that, frankly, when I had more time when I was younger, I enjoyed very much. So uh, hopefully we can all get back to that as quickly as possible, and I vote aye. Councilman Waring, I apologize. Were you voting yes? Did you hear what I said? I said yes. Oh, yes, thank my you. comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Williams? Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. We next move to item 61, which is the contract with Central Arizona Shelter Services and the Human Service Campus. Contracts, plural. Uh, let's see. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Move approval. Move Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, we do have members of the public to address the council, but it looks like count, did we have a uh, council member wanting to speak before we took public comment? Go ahead and I'll just speak afterwards. Perfect. Uh, we will begin with Victoria Gelder. 
Uh, yes, thank you, council members. Um, this is Victoria Gelder. Can you hear me? We can. Great, thank you. I appreciate your time. Um, I'll be brief. I'm going to only do a couple of bullet points, but I have quite the scroll, but I'm going to just do the two. Um, we're looking for the authority to enter into contracts with CAF and the human services, according to page 329. We'd like to reallocate um, some of the funds for CAF um, in regard to regionalizing the shelters. Uh, I've been a volunteer with the homeless for over 25 years and we're seeing that the population is growing and we need to start tailoring um, some of the shelters for the behavioral health, the addicted families, um, mothers and children and the veterans. That's my first bullet point. The second is transportation and, and giving people direction to getting the assistance that they need, whether it's DSS or D, D whatever, um, medical assistance. Uh, Circle the City can't possibly um, attend to all of the homeless and uh, so we need to have uh, some of that funding going to, my basic thing is um, for the shelters, we need to um, not segregate, but just tailorize so that we can really focus on the needs of the homeless and get them up to where they need to be, to be functional um, people in, in our county and in our state. And also um, the other thing that I wanted to do was uh, mention, they need showers. I mean, we they need showers. We don't have enough, and there's a there's a couple of um, vans that drive around, but they try to charge the homeless for getting a shower, and um, I just think that that's not acceptable. So I won't go on with my tirade right now. But thank you for your time, and I appreciate it and your consideration. Thank you. Uh, next will be Hannah Heyman, followed by Elizabeth Venable. We need more money to support the unsheltered folks in this city. CAS is not the only or best solution. CAS does not treat people with the dignity they deserve. And without the low barrier shelter that Nowakowski blocked with his cruelty, many people have nowhere to go. Give CAS the money to continue their work, but know that you must go much further to care for the people of the city. Just think, if you even cut a portion of the overfunded police department, there would be enough money to build new low barrier shelters and expand CAS. There would be enough money for a community land trust to build truly affordable housing without the greed of de developers. We know you have the resources to fund CAS properly and to create low barrier shelters and to provide adequate services for unsheltered people. But you instead you choose to give over $750 million every year to the most violent police in the nation who go out of their way to harass and harm unsheltered people of this city. Uh, your priorities are completely backwards and you know you were just up here smiling on screen mayor guy go you know please show us that there's a heart behind that smile um please you know give the money to cast as, as we know you will as i hope you do here but you know please have some imagination um and some heart for the people of this city Elizabeth Venable. Hello, can you hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hello? can. Okay, sorry. Um, sorry about the ad additional noise. Um, basically what I wanted to say is yes, obviously we need money for the castes of the world. Um, and I think also you all have recognized that congregate settings that are huge warehouses for the poor aren't necessarily the ultimate solutions for poverty. Um, however, I wanted to make sure that when you look at these regional shelters, you're looking at appropriate shelter and not simply busing people around to smaller facilities. Um, CASAS and other homeless facilities are not the Arizona Department of Corrections, and they need to be tailored and appropriate to the populations they serve. Um, we can't simply force people to go to places regardless of where they are. Um, and um, regardless of how attuned they are to the population. Again, I would encourage you to uh, approve low barrier shelter in the future. You're not providing um, resources for the most, uh, shall we say problematic in terms of not finding services, not accessing services. Um, 
we're not uh, creating creative resources for these people, and then we end up blaming them for their own circumstances. So I would say that definitely fund CAS, but uh, look beyond CAS and also hold CAS accountable. There's going to be a suit against CAS with a person that got intense burns from being held outside on uh, those lots. And I believe that they're with Lerner and Rowe. So, and it has nothing to do with me. So, um, and there was intense mortality on those lots which were operated by CAS. And so I think it's really important to hold them accountable even while we continue to advocate for funding for houselessness. Thank you. Thank you. That is our final public comment on this item. Uh, council member comments or questions? Um, and for our staff, could, um, uh, could you provide a brief update? Um, this is not the only activity that we are doing and we are hoping to find solutions throughout our city and provide uh, an ability for different populations that have different needs to have more targeted approaches. So could we provide a brief update on some of the other investments and the request for proposal process? Sure, good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Gallego and members of the City Council. Marshall Franklin, Human Services Director. So in addition to these funds that you all are voting on today, also in mid-February, you allocated staff to go out and to issue an RFP in the amount of about $9.1 million uh, to seek additional services around those who are experiencing homelessness with a focus around things like mental health, substance abuse, treatment, those types of things, as well as you also directed staff to issue an RFP for about approximately $14 million for shelter opportunities. Uh, again, focusing on, if you will, smaller specialized types of shelters, a focus again on those who can provide services in a shelter setting around substance abuse, uh, mental health treatment, and those types of things. And then as well, Mayor Geigo and members of the City Council, we are also very working very close, closely as a team with the Maricopa Association of Governments. They will be before you in a couple of weeks to give an overview of their regional strategy plan to address homelessness. And we as a city have been actively engaged in that in terms of the direction that you have provided to us to ensure that not only are we addressing homelessness in our community, but we're ensuring that regionally there are resources put in place uh, to address the need that occurs not here, but also across this region. Wonderful, thank you. We, in the last year, have devoted more resources than ever before to fight homelessness and to investing in affordable housing. We are well aware that we are nowhere near done, but we are trying many different strategies in this area. So this is one of many items we are bringing forward. Um, and, and Marcel, we talk often about caseworkers, but could you talk a little bit about uh, that in this context? Sure, May Gallego and members of the City Council, one of the things that we will be doing as we work with Central Arizona Shelter Services on this particular item before you is to ensure that there's some language in the contract uh, and the scope of work that centers around effective case management ratio ratios. So we know that individuals who are experiencing homelessness have different types of needs. And so we need to ensure that we are maximizing these funds that you have directed to be allocated to CAS in a way that we've got case management ratios that can ensure, if you will, the best outcomes. And that'll be included in the contract once it's executed with CAS. Wonderful, thank you. The folks who have been educating me on this have convinced me that uh, caseworkers are miracle workers and the more we can address individuals as individuals, the, the better outcomes we will have. And, and Marcelle, you and I also have had many uh, conversations about this, but I'm very hopeful we can give priority to folks who are heat vulnerable because that is a, a big challenge for us. Um, Council Member Nowakowski. Well, Mayor, I first wanna thank you for your, your homeless plan that the staff put together last year and really it's you're seeing the fruits from that we're implementing not just a plan throughout the whole city but also services that surround individuals to empower them and to help them out of the situation that they find themselves in so i just really want to thank yourself and and all the um, individuals that created that plan and found the resources to implement that plan 
because I think it's really easy to come out with a plan and basically it's the resources that support that plan. So I just really want to thank you and your leadership and all of our staff that put this plan together. The other thing too, is that I just want to make sure that we as a city ensure that the scope of work from the contracts are met and that the city needs to maintain an oversight, just making sure that the, the neighborhoods surrounding those facilities are feeling like the, their experience are, are positive, right? And that we basically, what they promised is gonna actually happen. So I think that surrounding individuals with services, having this regional plan, I think um, little by little, we're taking a step forward and ending homelessness in the city of Phoenix and hopefully for the state of Arizona. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you for your work on many of these issues, so many of these issues. Any additional council member questions or comments? Roll call. Pasicio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. I would just like to make a comment. I want to thank Marshall and Inger for coming and showing where the dollars were going to go and, and the services that were going to happen. That was part of my motion, so I really appreciate uh, all the efforts. Thank you. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Gallego. Yes. That's is 9-0. Thank you. Thanks to all who have worked on this and, and the folks out there doing the work every day. Uh, we it have hit 515, so I am going to go ahead and take item 69, and then we will take a 20-minute break before moving forward with our agenda. Um, item 69 is an item in Councilwoman Pastor's district, um, South City owned property at 11 West Cypress Street. So I will turn to Councilwoman Pastor for a motion. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to make a motion to approve item 69 with the following stipulations. First, develop an agreement uh, associated to this item is to be executed by May 1st, 2021. Second, uh, that the zoning process begin by June 1st, 2021. The final stipulation of, of neither this property nor the adjacent properties of 36 and 42 East Holly shall be transferred out of the city's ownership until the zoning is approved by city council and building permits are approved for the project and are ready to issue to the applicant. That's my motion. Second. And Councilman Pastor, can I ask you a quick question on that? Oh. All right, Councilman Pestor, were you done? Yes, I was. All right, Councilman. Oh, could you also add in there that the development agreement needs to be completed by July 1? Because they should be done with that pretty soon, but you still want to keep everything in line and in process and of exactly what you've already made a proposal under. Well, what I put is that uh, first, the development agreement associated with this item is executed by May 1st, 2021. Oh, okay. Well, that's even better. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. That's all I need. Thank you. All right. Any additional council member comments or questions? Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. I'm a yes, and I also want to thank um, Councilmember Pastor for her leadership on this. Thank you. I'm a yes, Pastor. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, Mayor, uh, it's, it looks like we do have a person who has requested to speak, so I just wanted to mention that real quick. Oh, okay. Th thank you so much. Um, we will go then to the phones for the person to speak. Uh, yes, uh, good Ms. afternoon. Uh, uh, this is Bramley Pollen. Uh, item 69. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilwoman uh, Pastor, for making the motion. 
Uh, I would ask that uh, along with that motion, I did not understand the last point, but if you could possibly amend your motion so that uh, there is more than enough time uh, that uh, the rezoning and uh, that is necessary um, and that the property can transfer by December 31st. Other than that, I'm in support of the motion. Thank you. That is our only public comment. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Pastore, you're still comfortable with your motion, right? Yes. Perfect. Um, can we continue with roll call, City Clerk? If you'd prefer to start over, you, you, I will defer to your thoughts. Yes, Mayor, we can continue. Stark? Yes. Waring? I apologize. Waring? Me? Yes. Thank you. Williams? Can you hear me? Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9 0. Thank you. And city manager, it appears you have turned on your microphone. <laughs> yes, Mayor. If if I might ask just uh, if we could just do the I think 70, 71, 72, 73, and 76 are basic procedural without public comment. If we could do those quickly, I could get some staff out of here uh, before we take a break, if that would be okay. All right, does that work for my colleagues? I have a conflict on 70 and 72. Works for me. Works All for me. Right. Okay. Let's do it then. Uh, item 70 is a Gateway Community College makership, makerspace parking agreement, helping us with our great partnerships with the community college and supporting our entrepreneurial economy. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Uh, roll call noting that Councilwoman Pastor will not be participating. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 7-1. Item 71 is our three-year membership agreement with the Arizona Israel Technology Alliance. Moving forward with our global economy. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? I'm sorry, do we have a motion on item 71? Yes, move approval. Second. Any comments? Roll call. Decisio. No. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes is eight one. Okay. Item seventy two is an intergovernmental agreement with the community college district for the culinary support services hub feasibility study, an item in uh, District 5. So uh, noting that Councilwoman Pestor will not be participating, perhaps Councilwoman Guardado would want to make a motion? Yes, definitely. A motion to approve item 72. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 7 1. Item 73 is the um, an amendment to the financial advisory services contract to add the downtown absorption rate studies. This is an item to help us with our planning in our downtown area, including our tool, our economic development tools. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? I move approval. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Decisio. No. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. 
Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 7-2. We next move to item 76, Airport Financial Advisory Services. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. Any comments? Roll call. DeCicio? No. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 7 2. Mayor, thank you for the consideration. I very much appreciate it. Wonderful. I'm glad some folks will get to uh, head home. And that was about as efficient 10 minutes as, as we have done. It is now 525. The Phoenix City Council will recess our formal meeting for 20 minutes and reconvene at 545. I want to call to order the continuation of the April 7th meeting of the Phoenix City Council. Will our city clerk please begin with a roll call? Councilman DeCicio? Councilmember Garcia? Here. Councilwoman Guardado? Here. Councilman Nowakowski? Here. Councilwoman Pastor? Yeah, here. Councilwoman Stark? Here. Councilman Waring? Here. Vice Mayor Williams? Here. Mayor Gallego? Here. Thank you all. We continue with our agenda with uh, an exciting item, the uh, 19 North Transit Ordinated Development Plan. Uh, we will begin with a staff report about this exciting item, have a public hearing, and then I will turn to Councilwoman Gordado um, for a motion. Uh, I will welcome Planning Director Alan Stevenson. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, this item is a uh, general plan amendment to add the 19 North TOD policy plan uh, as part of our reinvent uh, Phoenix planning process uh, for our six TOD plan along the light rail uh, 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 segments. So this next slide here shows where it fits in there. Uh, it does go from uh, just north of Bethany Home Road up to uh, Dunlap Avenue uh, along the 19th Avenue uh, and going into the surrounding properties. The 19 North uh, TOD policy plan uh, was really a, a labor of love uh, that was led by Shannon McBride and the 19 North community along with uh, some tremendous effort by staff from Maya Berkovich, Nick Klimek, and Samantha Keating. Uh, who all worked uh, tirelessly to, to make this planning process happen over the last uh, few years. And uh, you can see on uh, here, it's really three parts, current conditions, your vision and action plan comprise the, uh, the entirety of it. Uh, it does uh, really work with the community and their goals and vision of what they would, would like to see. Uh, I will cut our presentation short because Ms. McBride uh, would like to say a few words as well, and she really has been a, a champion of the, the 19 North community and this entire process and, and has really uh, screwheaded making it happen. This was approved by the um, North Mountain Village Planning Committee, 14 to zero, Alhambra uh, 10 to four, and the Planning Commission uh, nine to zero. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for our planning director? All right, I will open the public hearing 
And thank you to Shannon McBride for your leadership on this plan and for um, all your hard work in 19 North. Uh, the floor is yours. I just, you know, I, I got a little teary when you were talking there, Alan. Thank you. This is a, this is a, it is a labor of love and it's been a, a great process. So it all started with light rail coming down the center of our community and the community asking the question, what do we want for the future of our community? So businesses, schools, neighborhood groups, and city planning and neighborhoods and streets, we all just came together and, and with the amazing facilitative leadership of city planning have created this beautiful vision for our community that we can now continue to collaborate and work toward for the future of our area. So I'm just so um, thankful. I'm proud of the process because it really was as healthy and as collaborative as you can get between city and, and community and neighbors and police and schools all working together. It was a beautiful process. And I'm specifically, I'm just really grateful that, a, you know, for Maya and Nick and Samantha, as, as Alan shared, who were doing this work above and beyond everything else they were doing. So um, it was just beautiful process. I'm so deeply grateful and I just would appreciate all of your support on this so that we can continue our work together. Thank you. Thank you. I will close the public hearing and turn to Councilwoman Gordado. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I have a motion to approve the general plan amendment for 19 North TOD policy plan and adopt the related resolution. Second. We have a motion and a second. Also recognizing that the plan covers parts of council district four as well. Uh, do we have any additional comments? I do. A woman, right off. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, so the 19 North planning process was a truly collaborative effort between the city and the 19 North community that engaged residents, businesses, and schools in the area. The planning process and final plan are examples of how the community can organize itself and collaborate with the city of Phoenix to create a collective vision for the future. The approval of the plan helps to close the gap in policy guidance for the area surrounding light rail along 19th Avenue. The plan will help guide both public investment, private development, and community priorities. The community's vision embodied in the plan creates an opportunity for new development to meet the needs of the community while embracing the city's investment in light rail along 19th Avenue. The plan also articulates a vision for 2040 and a roadmap for the first steps needed to make that vision a reality. Thank you to Shannon McBride, the 19 North community and its newly created community advocacy board that will spearhead these first steps towards the vision in the coming months. Looking forward to helping to implement this plan and very excited and happy to support and, and be the councilwoman um, for, this, for this district and hoping to be able to create amazing things together with everyone else. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman, for your hard work on this. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is how planning is supposed to work. And I credit a lot to the planning staff and to District 5 and to the community, and in particular, Shannon McBride. She has certainly been um, the energizer bunny for this policy plan. And I am very excited about this. Um, as it goes up north, it, it starts to get close to my district. And so I see that this could grow even further and further. So I'm very excited to um, uh, be a part of the future planning process of 19th Avenue. Thank you. Councilwoman Pastor. Yes, I would uh, like to thank uh, Shannon McBride, but also those that participated in the TUD. One thing about the TUD uh, policy plan, as uh, Councilwoman Stark mentioned, uh, this is where we bring community together to really uh, put their ideas and work with uh, our planning department on making the dreams come true and putting it in a plan in order for it to happen for the future. Uh, sometimes, uh, the TODs are created and uh, with great intentions and then what happens is when it comes into play or implemented, it could be two or three years later of the implementation 
and we have new people in the community that uh, then learn about a TOD. Uh, that is happening throughout our city with reInvent. All of us uh, in the Central Corridor uh, have a reInvent and, and TUD overlays over different pieces. So this is the beginning process of the 19 North uh, of building. So really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Guardado for uh, continuing uh, and leading this project process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, appreciate everyone was involved. Our planning department really took the lead with the council office, but also housing, light rail administration, neighborhood services, office of arts and culture, street transportation, community and economic development. This really has been a great silo busting effort. Uh, as, as folks know, I am a big fan of our light rail system. Plans like this allow the community to get the most benefit possible out of it. Make sure we emphasize what's unique about every neighborhood and how the light rail can support it, how we can make sure it benefits the people who are in the community while bringing in amenities that they desire, making sure it's safe and walkable in the corridor. Um, it's fun to see how much this corridor has changed. As a councilwoman, I got to be there at, at some of the beginning planning for this corridor, and I remember um, the Open Door Fellowship located on 19th Avenue, uh, watching with interest as light rail moved in and other city improvements were taking place. Um, and Shannon McBride, who was a pastor at ODF for many years, uh, personally watching, being invested in, in how it works, uh, and then taking on the, the, the leadership role and helping create 19 North Community Alliance. Uh, I think pushing us and asking us questions, but then uh, really embracing and, and helping take things to the next level. So we're grateful for all involved. And, and certainly this is a, a success story for our city and we're just getting started. Uh, any additional comments before we vote? Roll call. Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Nowakowski? Yes. Thank you. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8 0. Passes unanimously. Congratulations. We next move to item four, the southeast corner of Third Avenue and Coolidge Street. Uh, we will begin with a staff report and open a public hearing. Uh, each uh, side will have 10 minutes to update the council in a longer presentation. We'll take individual comments. Um, Councilwoman Pestor, uh, will, we will turn to her for a motion. Alan Stevenson, our planning director, will begin unless... Um... Alan can begin. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, this request is uh, located in the crosshatch area shown on this aerial at the southeast corner of 3rd Avenue and Coolidge Street within the Pearson Place uh, neighborhood. Uh, this existing zoning is R3 and R5 with a uh, multifamily residential uh, zoning on it. The proposed zoning the applicants requested is walkable urban code uh, T55. Uh, it's also within the Uptown Character Area Transit District for a proposed multifamily uh, residential project. Before we get into the specifics of the, the project a little bit more, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some of the prior planning that's taken place within this area. As, as Councilwoman Pastor alluded to on the, the previous item, a lot of times when there are, are planning efforts that are undertaken and uh, the, the council takes action on those policy uh, guidance, it's a number of years before private property owners uh, may uh, utilize what comes forward out of those planning processes to, to then revitalize those properties and or redevelop them. And then sometimes there are changeovers in, in uh, neighborhood composition and folks that are involved. And so the slide you're looking at right here shows uh, in this case, uh, that as far back as 1971, this area uh, where the subject site is located 
was shown for uh, high rise and more intense residential zoning with unlimited or intense zoning with unlimited height on the subject parcel. So this was the, the general plan back in 1971, which was about intensifying that Central Avenue corridor and included that parcel. So as far back as the 70s, there had been a stated intent to try and intensify that central corridor so that we would have more uh, you know, active development and continue to revitalize that area as at that time we were growing uh, wildly in the suburban parts of the city. There was also a desire by the community to, to focus inside as well, dating as far back to the 70s. Uh, so this is jumping forward to, to the 2000 general plan. And so you can see the subject site and this is designated residential 15 plus dwelling units per acre. Uh, it was also zoned R5 uh, for the bulk of the site and a little portion R3 um, at this time as well. And so you can see that it has been called out for intense residential development you know, since the, the 70s uh, in terms of, of height and then now the, the general plan with 15 plus. Uh, so fast forward to the, the discussion that the city undertook as part of the light rail planning efforts when uh, the city had a, a multi-year effort that predated the, the reInvent Phoenix process to adopt the strategic policy framework. And that established uh, a, a place type within each of the station areas and the surrounding areas. And so uh, it was something that was undertaken with all of the discussion of surrounding neighbors and community uh, members. Uh, back when this was done, this was an issue uh, where the Uptown Transit Overlay came up with a, a unique uh, historic um, uh, residential uh, place type for a minor urban center that really came into, uh, into play and creation as part of that Uptown District discussion with uh, all of the surrounding neighborhoods uh, in the Four Corners area, which included Pearson Place. Um, the reInvent Phoenix uh, planning process then began a few years uh, after that, uh, after the city received a, a federal grant to do that. This is within the Uptown uh, TOD policy plan, and as part of that policy plan, there was additional outreach and work with uh, all the four uh, corners neighborhood associations that included Pearson Place, and within that, the, the land use element, uh, which is what you're seeing here, a little vignette of, and what it showed was a medium to low intensity place type of two to five stories with an incentive up to uh, seven stories within this particular uh, area. So it did uh, identify this parcel as part of that process for the most intense level of the minor urban center place type, uh, which is that uh, five stories. Uh, it also an outgrowth of the reInvent Phoenix planning process was the Grand Canalscape improvements. And so uh, as part of that overall reInvent process, the city went forward and applied for another federal grant to do the uh, Grand Canalscape improvements that were uh, um, approved and then ultimately constructed. And so they represent about $23 million of physical improvements along the Grand Canal for about 12 miles from I-17 to 56th Street. Uh, and the Street Transportation Department reports that they're working closely with Council District 5 to uh, expand this in, in Phase 3 uh, further west in the Maryvale area that will start uh, soon as well. And so this is important because it also lays a, a foundation of this site is adjacent to the, the Grand Canal and those improvements that the applicant is proposing to help further the overall public uh, investment of the Grand Canalscape and what's happening here. And so uh, as we all know, no shock to you, Phoenix continues to lead the nation uh, for growth. We're the fastest growing city and the fastest growing county in the country. Uh, this Four Corners uh, area was named by uh, a business uh, gazette as one of the um, hottest intersections uh, by the Urban Land Institute. Um, and that is a factor of the fact that there's a, a light rail uh, connection here. It also, uh, with that light rail connection, has generated a lot of fantastic restaurant and other mixed use opportunities that really are a, a catalyst for some change in this area, but that is, is predicated on the fact that uh, people know there's going to be additional multifamily development coming in this area to have rooftops 
to support all the fantastic restaurants and other things that are happening within the, the community. And uh, that does lead to some challenges in terms of what uh, you know, communities may expect, particularly newer residents who might not have, have moved in when we had and went through all these planning processes uh, to come up with. So jumping back to the subject site here, you can see that this shows the existing zoning, which is R5 um, and R3. R5 allows uh, about 43 dwelling units per acre. The R3 allows up to 15 uh, dwelling units per acre by right. Uh, to the east is uh, zoned R5, uh, also that 43 dwelling units per acre. And then uh, to the west is the rest of the, the Pearson Place neighborhood. And even though it is developed principally with uh, single family structures, there are some duplex in a, a couple multifamily structures. Um, they're not as intense as the zoning would allow. It is zoned R3, which it again allows that 15 dwelling units per acre. However, it does have an HP overlay um, on the Pearson Place Historic District because uh, it is a historic uh, district. So the applicant's proposal is this multifamily uh, apartment project here. You see with a central uh, parking structure and then an amenity area within the, the middle of the site and then uh, a, the walkable urban code requirements as it relates to the building uh, step back and the, the trees along Coolidge and Third, and then also improvements along the uh, Grand Canal scape to really take advantage of that $23 million of public improvements and all the public that's using the Grand Canal and providing some additional open space area that can be used uh, by folks within that, um, you know, using the canal. Uh, as well. This is a, a view from Coolidge Street of the subject site, uh, and here is a, a view on 3rd. I should also note that 3rd is uh, as part of the bicycle uh, master plan because there is a bridge that goes over the Arizona Canal to connect the, the bicycle um, traffic going over the canal but not vehicle traffic uh, to continue to the south. Uh, and this is that view from the, the canal uh, escape as well here so you can see what those uh, proposed improvements would look like in the future. Uh, in this case, staff does recommend approval subject to 13 stipulations. The Hamburg Village Planning Committee recommended approval 15 to 1 and the Planning Commission recommended approval uh, 7 to 1. Staff does recommend approval per the Planning Commission recommendation and adoption of the related ordinance and with that I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Director Stevenson. Do we have any questions or comments before we go to the public hearing? All right. I will call uh, to order the public hearing. We will begin with 10 minute presentations from each side, uh, beginning with the applicant. And um, then we will go. We have a, a large number of members of the public wishing to provide comment. Each will have two minutes. No donation of time is allowed. And we will begin with Jason Morris on behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Madam. Sorry, I want to make sure this is there. We go. You can see thank it. You, Mayor. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, I appreciate that. For the record, Jason Morris with you, Morris, on behalf of the applicant, Intrinsic Residential. Uh, frankly, given the last item on your agenda, uh, which was approved, uh, and Mr. Stevenson's excellent overview of this site, uh, I will try and be extraordinarily brief. Uh, this is one of the most exciting projects that we have had the benefit of working on, especially in this area. And it's rare that we're able to have a case which virtually touches upon every approved plan and overlay and recommendation for this area. Um, but we are fortunate in working with Trinsic Residential on this site in, in that they bring their experience, they bring their sustainability, they bring their architecture, and they bring their willingness uh, to work to create an excellent community, which is what they've done here. Uh, what you're looking at in our opening slide is part of our canalscape design, and we'll go into that later, but it's really indicative of how special this parcel is and how unique the opportunity is to take advantage not only of the canalscape, but also the transit 
and the walkability of this area. As we go to the first slide, if you will, uh, our overview is probably indicative more than anything of why this land use is so appropriate, Mayor and Council. Uh, in this instance, the, the parcel is outlined in blue. As you can see, we are adjacent to multifamily development on our south and eastern boundaries. On our northern boundary across Coolidge, it is a combination of multifamily and single family. And to the west is the single family uh, heart of Pearson Place on the west side of 3rd Avenue. So as we look at our surrounding uses and we see our proximity to the canal, we also are taking advantage of the fact that there is a light rail station within walking distance. We have just heard about the importance of TOD and long term planning, and this is illustrative of everything that is necessary from a well planned community, uh, not only in terms of form and use, but also in proximity, uh, recognizing that we are in the urban center of what we have just heard is yet again the fastest growing metropolitan area in the nation. Uh, so turning from that to our next slide, a little bit more about the site. We've heard the size of it and we know the location. Uh, this gives you another vantage point to show not only how close we are to the light rail, uh, but how we are able to take advantage of the canalscape in the future that has not been taken advantage of. And I think this is a very good exhibit to show you can see that you know, presently and, and really most of the development that occurs next to the canal is basically parking lots or, or awnings uh, adjacent to the canal with fences rather than embracing that canalscape and making it an active amenity, which we are doing with this application. Uh, importantly, it is already zoned R5 and R3. Uh, it is shown in the general plan and as we've seen has been shown for a generation or more for this high density and high intensity use. It's within the Uptown Transit Oriented Development Plan, which you know I must highlight calls for over a thousand units for this immediate area uh, in the coming years to count and maintain the densities that are necessary to deal with our influx of population, but also to build upon the investment the city has already made in this area. Uh, we're also at the crossroads of the Sonoran Bikeway and the Grand Canal tra uh, Trail, and as I mentioned, within walking distance to the light rail. Next slide, please. The building amenities, uh, as you can see, it's a four story building uh, with a mezzanine uh, to allow for certain fourth, fourth uh, on the fourth floor, certain units to have that mezzanine benefit. Uh, the parking structure is entirely wrapped and will not be visible. Uh, our only driveway for the project is onto Coolidge at the east end of the project, adjacent to other multifamily uh, and directs out to Central, so it does not cause additional cut through traffic. Um, and in, in terms of the frontages, we have been very cognizant of trying to make this walkable, approachable and livable, but also active at the street scene. And you can see from this exhibit on the page that we also have proximity to the pedestrian bridge uh, adjacent to the canal uh, that will convey both bikers and pedestrians. And we're trying to take advantage and design around that. I'm going to go quickly through some other of our elevations on the next slide. Next slide. This would be the Coolidge elevation, uh, which shows our only garage access and the only main driveway. Uh, in fact, the only driveway on the project, as well as our uh, lobby. Next slide. Uh, if we can go one slide. No, oh, there we go. Uh, this shows our canalscape. Uh, I gave uh, a little bit of an overview of that in our previous uh, discussion, but it also it, it gives an indication of what the two million dollars of improvements to the canalscape creates. Which, if we can go back a slide, uh, it, you can see another vantage point. It is virtually a linear park adjacent to the canal. And this has not been done in any previous residential plan and really represents what is intended 
uh, by the city in their investment in this area and, and what that urban core should look like. Uh, now, if you'll move forward two slides. There you go. Uh, in, in terms of support, because this is important from where we have been throughout this uh, now nine month journey, we are pleased to stand before you with a recommendation of staff and if you just heard uh, an extraordinary staff recommendation of approval, along with an almost unanimous approval from the Alhambra Village, as well as the Phoenix Planning Commission. Uh, it's supported by the Phoenix General Plan, the Reinvent Phoenix Plan, the Uptown TOD, the Alhambra Village Character Plan for this precise area, um, as well as the Grand Canalscape and the Phoenix Bikeway Plan. Uh, in addition to that, we have community support. We've had businesses and residents who have reached out and supported this case by contacting either the Councilwoman's Office or the Planning Department. And, and my last slide, given the short amount of time I have, is going to focus on where we've been and where we are. And uh, we recognize that this is a change. Uh, as you saw from the original slide, this was an office building for a very long time. And while the office characteristics of this area, I think were accepted by the neighborhood because the neighborhood largely grew up and grew around it with the ownership, the change to multifamily, despite the fact that it has been zoned multifamily for such a long time, has been a difficult one. And with the help of the councilwoman's office, who has brought both sides together, uh, we have tried to make concessions to address those concerns. The first concern has been height. And because it is zoned R5 and permitted at 48 feet, we have conceded to go to 48 feet on both of the frontages that uh, uh, are adjacent to single family residential, which would be our west and our north frontage along Coolidge and 3rd Avenue. Uh, so that concession has been made. In terms of the parking, because there was concern about driving in through this neighborhood and on street parking, if the residents didn't have adequate parking, we have addressed that. In fact, we have addressed that beyond the needs of the R5 that it is zoned. Uh, the R5, frankly, would allow us to go at, at 0.8 per bedroom. Uh, based upon this plan, but instead we are going with a much more aggressive parking plan that gives us 1.1 parking spaces per bedroom. Uh, this is something that's very important to Trinsic that has thousands of units uh, that they have built and managed, and they understand the needs of their tenants because their desire is to keep the tenants happy and keep them as longtime tenants in the area. So parking is a key and something that we have addressed. And we are willing to make sure that is addressed at the higher level. In terms of the units, the R5 does have a lower density, but the caveat there, Mayor and Council, is that there is no limit on bedrooms. So we could build virtually more buildings, actually, more buildings, I'm sorry, more bedrooms, a total of 304. Uh, than we could under the walkable urban code that we are utilizing. So we are actually scaling back in terms of the number of bedrooms and bedrooms mean fewer bedrooms mean fewer people, fewer people mean fewer cars, which means that the concessions that we have made and staying at 218 dwelling units per acre, sorry, 218 units overall for this site represent a better plan for the neighbors if that is their concern. Uh, we've made other concessions, Mayor, in wrapping up in terms of the setback to ensure we meet a 20 foot setback from the curb uh, so that we meet the expectation of the neighborhood. And we have also agreed to address the design uh, to ensure that it encompasses all of the neighborhood privacy concerns. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about the project. Uh, would hope for your support this evening and uh, stand willing to discuss any aspect of the application. Thank you. Thank you. We will next go to the appellant, uh, which uh, neighborhoods will have up to 10 minutes uh, for a formal presentation. Then everyone who has registered to speak will get two minutes on their own. Uh, we will begin with Ron.
Hi there. Hello. So my name is Ron Tremitovic. I'm the appellant in zoning case 56-20-4. And I think the first thing I need to start uh, with the council is that we are not opposing the development. We are opposing the zoning change. Um, with this this zoning change is happening deep, deep within a historic neighborhood away from arterial roads. And while we all want to beautify the canal, there are there are definitely um, there's there's three sides to this building that needs to be looked at. So I want to start by saying this is uh, the homeowner opposition that is um, with me as well. This is the homeowners, but we also have many residents who have many years invested in these neighborhoods and care about what happens. There are several things that we are concerned about um, height, traffic, parking and setbacks. And we um, I don't want to waste time on uh, responding to Mr. Morris. I'd like to go ahead with my presentation, but we have only just come to the table uh, last week. So the concessions are starting to happen, but they have not quite gotten where we want yet. So we will discuss that at the end. But let's go with the first slide, please, because I want to talk about the zoning. Uh, next slide. So a WU is an urban walkable code that started in 2015 to address the federal funding of the light rail and the and the and the building of the density around it. But each one of the urban uh, codes has a tier to it, and Trinsic is going for one of the highest possible. And we do not have single family homes adapted to businesses or a broad mix of retail offices and residential. Um, we are definitely a single family residential area. Next slide, please. And as you can see by the actual slides, it really breaks down what they're going for and how inappropriate it is. We are a low intensity uh, single family home neighborhood with duplexes, some single family two stories. We do not have any retail or dining within our neighborhood. It's all along our Chilio roads. Um, but they're going for the T5, and that requires a broad mix of buildings, and those buildings are generally pretty high. And even if they went down to a 5.2 or 5.3, we do not have a small commercial street scale air, commercial area in our neighborhood. Everything commercial is along um, arterial roads, and that is one of the biggest reasons that this is very inappropriate for our location. Next slide, please. So this is what you're actually looking at when you look west of the development. As you can see, that is Kim's house on the left alongside Karen's house. And then on the right, we have Paula's house and Adam's house. Adam in particular is very concerned about his privacy. Imagine having uh, four stories looking down into your backyard. Next slide, please. So on the left there is Monica's house and on the right there is Teresa's house. They are directly north of the prospect. You can see the curb. Um, they are concerned about losing sun with the height and um, they're concerned about a lot of things. Teresa is going to be looking at that parking garage. So it might not be directly across the street from her house, but it is close enough. Next slide, please. So I want you to get a good look at this because the, 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 the photos you just saw are amazing. I mean, the, the, the the photos of the development show like a big grassy area across the street and they show a nice big building, but that's not what's happening across the street on 3rd Avenue or Coolidge Street. We have houses and those shots would be from yards, which have trees and, and people living there. The two thirds of this area around it are single family homes. And then we go into more residential. So the east is a, regi a residential apartment complex to the northeast is more residential. We are talking a residential neighborhood. Next slide, please. So just to show you Google, um, Google Maps, you know, they kind of show businesses. And as you can see, the businesses are along the arterial roads. Third Avenue does not have a single business along it. It's almost all single family homes with some apartment complexes and duplexes that are, are small scale. Next slide, please. This is what a T55 normally looks like. This is on the northwest corner of Indian School and Central. There are two large arterial roads and it stretches all the way to 3rd Avenue. 3rd Avenue is a collector street to the south, taking you downtown. And if you go north, you won't quite get into our neighborhood because there is a canal stopping you. So it is surrounded by commercial. It is surrounded by arterial roads. And that black circle there is the light rail. That is how close the T55 is to the light rail. It's literally outside the door. Next slide, please. 
So in the summer, you're walking to the light rail and the closest way you're going to get there corner to corner, not door to door, is 1,708 feet to the Campbell Station. The Campbell Station mostly serves Central High and Brophy. Next slide, please. They're trying to say reinvent Phoenix really wants this area to build up but um, I call it cherry picking. There's plenty of maps in there where we are not part of the WU code. The dotted lines there are the TOD overlay. We are clearly not part of that. And even um, in the existing conditions here with the reInvent Phoenix, you can see we are clearly outside the circle of the Central and Campbell uh, stop. Next slide, please. We are also outside the public transport master plan. That is the site there in the red. Uh, again, it is not part of what should be building to a T55. Um, next slide, please. And again, here is another area where it is not part of the plan. This is, um, keep going. Next slide, please. I, I, this one is particularly important because it has a quote in here that I want you to think about. The plan serves as a policy guidance. It's not regulatory. Additional outreach and research on underlying conditions and appropriateness should be conducted during the rezoning phase. We didn't have outreach. We feel very neglected. You saw how many people are involved in this. We are not part of this process until literally last week. It's not enough time for us to really be part of this process. Um, it's a very this has been a very frustrating thing both at Alhambra and at the Planning Commission. I won't get into our stories there. We don't have time, but um, this should have never gotten to City Council. Next slide, please. This is the TOD overlay. We are not part of it. We are clearly outside of it. There is the canalscape. Um, that is TOD one for Uptown. I'm taking this off City of Phoenix websites. This is all coming from your websites. Next slide, please. And this is the neighborhood. Again, um, Mr. Morris showed uh, it in his version, and I am also showing something very similar. This, this, is, this is the view of it. We are cut off to the south by the canal. We have um, light rail to the north and east, and we have suicide lanes to the west. We are a very tight neighborhood. Next slide, please. Uh, they put their parking garage with their single enter entrance and exit on Coolidge to the east, uh, but it only goes right, so anyone going south We'll go that way perhaps, but next slide, please. The majority of the neighborhood is gonna to have to come up the bike path or through because 7th Avenue and Campbell, Campbellback travel better. Next slide, please. And what goes out must come in. I looked at their traffic study and their traffic study is saying this is gonna generate about 1200 cars a day in this, this area alone. Next slide, please. That's the Sonoran bike path looking up next that is the development right there where those trees are. And it is gonna come within 10 to 12 feet of the, um, of the curb if it is zoned for the WT55. Next slide, please. You know, I know he says that we have ample parking, but there's only 29 spaces for guests and other halves. And maybe, maybe that is considered ample to most people, but there is gonna be no parking in our neighborhood. You saw the other map. They want to make the area around their building no parking, which pushes these people into our streets of Coolidge and Hazelwood. They are gonna be parking up and down. And part of the issue with that is visibility. This is the Third Avenue bike path. You are really creating a lot of traffic and parking along that bike path as they park up Third Avenue or cut through to get to Camelback. Next slide, please. And that this is what we already see in the neighborhood. Now imagine this at night, you know, kids, dogs, the visibility is really limited. By the way, note that tree on the left. That's what happens when you build a 10 to 12 foot easement. They just have the really hardest time growing in the uh, heat. Go ahead, next slide, please. Um, they're saying it's gonna generate similar traffic. I just went over that we went to the traffic report. Um, so we're gonna skip this one. Next slide, please. And they say that we want a thousand more residents in the area. Well, I got news for you. There's 3,000 more residents coming just with the things planned. Now, ele elevation is part of that. So if you subtract that, we're still at about 2,800. We've got northeast corner of Indian School and Central, northwest corner of Indian School and Central. We've, of course, got the bank on Central and Camelback. 
We got the, the new one coming up on Camelback near 7th Avenue. We have them all over us. So we, we do have 3,000 more residents coming regardless. This property does not have to be this big. We can we work together and have manageable for the neighbor. Uh, thank you for that presentation. It's clear um, everyone has been putting a lot of time into this. Um, we do. We do have a large uh, number of members of the public and the applicant to testify. Uh, each will have two minutes and we will begin um, with the applicant. And that is Shane Essert. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, first, we'd like to start off by uh, saying I'm extremely familiar with the area. Um, I'm a third generation Phoenician. I've lived off Central Avenue, uh, just north of Camelback for uh, my entire life. Uh, I went to Brophy uh, some time ago, and uh, my family owns a, a business off of Central as well. Um, I just want to say I'm in strong support of this project. Um, as people have touched on, uh, there is a huge demand for um, all of the residents that are moving to Phoenix. Um, I uh, have also had a chance to look at Trinsix uh, plans and I am very familiar with their product. Um, I'm excited for the high quality um, product that they will deliver. Um, the activation of the canalscape will be a very positive amenity for the area, um, and this will play nicely with the uh, a light rail. So, um, you know, we need apartments like this uh, to support businesses, and um, I, I ask you guys to all join me in support of this project. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to actually uh, turn to Matt to call the members of the public to testify. Thank you, Mayor. Our next speaker is Patricia Anderson. Patricia, are you on the line? I'm sorry, Patricia is not on the line. So let's go next to next speaker, Tanya Bushalo. Tanya, are you on the line? And our next speaker then uh, would be Robert Donat. Robert, are you on the line? Yes, I am here. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, and Council members and city staff. My name is Robert Donat. Um, I lived eight houses down from this proposed zoning for about the last eight years. I've been on the neighborhood board for about the last seven. Um, I've supported developments in the area, including the one that Ron spoke of, Elevation on Central, which is on Central and Coolidge, and I've supported the now failed OmniNet project down on Pearson and Central. Both of those projects were on Central. So let me tell you that Coolidge Street actually is deteriorating. I've created many tickets with the streets department to patch up our roadway, further traffic on Coolidge Street, particularly between 7th Avenue and Central, already has more traffic from elevation on Central with a lot of morning speeding to get down to Central Avenue from 7th Avenue. The current traffic mitigation efforts make very little difference. The streets are a mixture of folks getting in their morning walks, dogs of all kinds, freight trucks, delivery vans, and even other large vehicles that drive down Coolidge every day. My windows vibrate from those uh, vehicles. So this would be adding already more parking and adds more vehicles to an already crowded street. So please, if you allow me to read a portion of the city's historic preservation department's description of our neighborhood. Pearson Place Historic District is designed following a grid street pattern with 60 foot wide roads and vertical curbs. Because the area was in the county when it was primarily built out between 1910 and 1956, there are no sidewalks. There is a sense of openness achieved by the pattern of, relative, of modestly sized homes on relatively large lots with front yard setbacks that often exceed 30 feet. I'm happy to hear the developer's concessions, but does this zoning change align with the character of our neighborhood? I don't feel that it does, and I hope you feel the same way. Please vote no on this rezoning application. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Adam Gibbs. Adam, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I'm here. Please proceed. Mayor, City Council members, my name is Adam Gibbs, and I'm expressing my opposition of this rezoning case. The subject property is already designated as R3, R5 multifamily zone that is located on two side streets and surrounded on two sides by the federally recognized Pearson Place Historic District. Currently in the city of Phoenix, most walkable urban code properties are located along major arterial streets such as Central, Indian School, and Camelback. The few ex exceptions that exist are still located on major secondary streets, but additionally and more importantly, they are surrounded by commercial properties. Currently, construction has begun on a T55 property that would be the same zoning as this uh, proposal that's at 4100 North Central Ave. This is the intersection of Central and Indian School and spans all the way to 3rd. I ask you, how can building on to the corner of two of the busiest streets in Phoenix be granting the same zoning of type on a property that's located within a residential neighborhood? Now, as a property owner that is located directly across the street from this proposed development, I'm disproportionately affected by the reduced setbacks and increased height that this zoning change would provide for. I would have a 56 foot tall building that is located only approximately 40 feet from my property spanning an entire block. R5 zoning requires that the property has a minimum setback of 20 feet from the street versus the proposed, which is 10 feet. It also limits the height by an additional eight feet. Also, the existing zoning provides 53 less units than proposed. This reduction in density reduces the traffic and parking concerns that will affect the Pearson Place and surrounding neighborhoods. To tie everything together, my opposition to this rezoning case stems from suitability. Simply put, a T55 type building with its increased height and reduced setbacks does not belong in a residential neighborhood. It belongs on major arterial roads. It's for these reasons that I hope you will support me and my neighbors in opposing this zoning change. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dylan Hall. Dylan, are you on the line? I am. Uh, I just want to say that the city ought to deny TRG's application under the WU code because the subject property is excluded from the city's acting iteration of the Uptown TOD and master plan. The Uptown TOD map appended to chapter 13 clearly excludes this parcel from the TOD overlay. The city's current master plan excludes this site from its final TOD urban walkable area recommendations as well. It is not located within the area circumscribed by the city's interim transit oriented zoning overlay district map, which is the relevant authority in this matter. Because an approval of this request would be tantamount to the sanctioning of spot zoning, the city should deny TRD's application to rezone this site to WU code T55. Secondly, even if the site were located in the TOD or in an area that were subject to the WU code, the proposed development scale and density are not conforming to the descriptions governing the appropriateness and permissibility of a given WU type in relation to the existing conditions of the surrounding area. The WU code states that transect districts vary by intensity of their physical and social character and describes T55 as a medium height intensity mixed use fabric characterized by a broad mix of buildings that are integrated by retail offices, live work and residential units adjacent to the right rail corridor averaging a height of 56 to 100 feet. As Ron has explained, that is not the case here. We do not oppose development in this area, that, um, but we do oppose this because the subject property is not located in the area circumscribed as we have discussed. And even if it were, uh, the WU code does not provide for this development because it's inconsistent with the surrounding one and two story historic structures and setbacks of surrounding properties. The subject site does not meet code requirements for WU T55. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope that you can see through some of the selective presentations of the master plan and what this uh, project pretends for the neighborhood. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Hayes. Teresa, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Teresa Hayes and I live uh, at 204 West Coolidge, which is directly across the street to the north of this proposed uh, development. I am adamantly opposed to this uh, zoning changes that Trinsic is uh, proposing in our neighborhood. I'm very concerned about the, of course, the heights, the setback, but especially the traffic 
that will impact my home on Coolidge Street, as well as my surrounding neighbors and the future parking issues that will occur. The amount of cars they're proposing uh, will be 1,200. That is to me an atrocious amount to add to our neighborhood. The parking issues will affect uh, my property as well as my neighbors next to me because I am directly across the street. If there are visitors and other people uh, you know, coming to this property, they will be parking directly across the street. My issues are that how will my garbage and my recycling be picked up? And that will eventually affect the city because I'll be calling them every day, having cars towed and other things. My other issue is the ingress and egress that will be directly across the street, barely one uh, property down from me because we already have an ingress for the icon, which is to the east of Trinsic. Across the street is a small project. And then of course we'll have the Trinsic um, ingress and egress directly in front of my house. So uh, Mayor Gallego and your fellow council, men, please, I oppose this. This is just not a good thing. And I thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Terry Lockhead. Terry, are you on the line? It looks as though Terry is not on the line, but I believe uh, James Lockhead is on the line. James, can you hear me? Actually, I'm Terry Lockhead. Um, I can, hear you. can you hear me? No, he can't hear you. Here, here, talk to him. Go ahead. Oh, we're on two different units here. This is Terry Lockhead. I live at 301. Uh, West Coolidge, and we are directly across the street from the proposed development. Um, I do oppose um, the uh, WUT55 zoning. Um, it was purchased as R3, R5. Um, the heights, the setbacks, the um, the increased traffic, you know, I um, echo the sentiments of all of my neighbors, and to be brought into this one week to tangible discussions, you know, with Councilwoman Pastor, um, you know, we have learned a lot um, and we're just trying to protect the integrity of our neighborhood, not opposing the development, just the zoning that they're proposing. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, uh, was James also going to speak? Speak? My name is Jim Lockett. My wife is putting phones in my ear. My name is Jim Lockett. I live at 301 West Cooper Street, which is directly across from the project. I uh, I can't add much to what Ron and Adam and others have said. Uh, I don't relish the idea of people looking in my backyard. I don't relish the idea of uh, the traffic that'll be up. And more awesome is the uh, is a limited setback. Now I've heard some concessions, which is a step in the right direction, but I don't know that we're done yet. I appreciate your time. I'm not uh, I'm not quite as erudite as the folks have spoken before me. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jenny Madison. Jenny, are you on the line? It appears like she is no longer on the line. So our next speaker is Karen McCasland. Uh, Karen, are you on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. Please proceed. Um, I am I am against it. Jenny, we seem to have lost your audio. Okay, we'll proceed to our next speaker, um, Nancy McMillan. Hello. Hello, Nancy. Hi, my name. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your time for listening to our case. Um, everyone has presented the same problems that I agree with. I live closer to Camelback. I am on Mariposa and Third Avenue. I see and feel and hear the traffic every day. I am right on Third Avenue on the side of my house. I do not see anything that shows that the increase of 1,200 cars per day to what's already two to 3,000 cars per day due to cut through 
because of the suicide lane on 7th Avenue is a big problem. Um, I, uh, I do appreciate the growth in Phoenix and I do understand our corner is very desirable on Central and Camelback. If this building was on Central and Camelback, maybe the corner that was supposed to have been built years ago, it would be a perfect solution and a perfect place for it to be. That is an arterial street. This is an in internal neighborhood that is not prepared to handle the traffic. As we all know, Phoenix is one of the top cities in the country for pedestrian deaths. If we have this much traffic, this many people walking on the streets, it is not going to be safe for anyone. Um, the setbacks are important and while the canalscape is beautiful on their design plans, you are shifting the internal side of the neighborhood with the setbacks that were currently in place, although I understand they have agreed to go to a bit bigger setback. I yield, thank you. It, it looks like Karen McCasland may have been able to reconnect. Karen, are you on the line? I am on the line. Please proceed. Um, I agree with everyone that uh, the traffic is going to be horrid. Uh, People aren't uh, people aren't going to go to Camelback or to Central because there's only one way to turn on Central. So most of the people will be going down Coolidge, which I live on Coolidge, down to Seventh Ab Avenue. Um, we already have way too many cars with the apartment buildings that are on Coolidge already. It's very difficult in the evening to turn right even on Coolidge from Central uh, because of all the cars that are parked on the street and the people walking across the street and the people opening their doors uh, to get into their cars and the uh, the delivery trucks. It's, it's the traffic is already horrible um, and people will park in front of that the new building. Um, so, uh, I am very opposed to it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Monica Medina. Monica, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Please proceed. Thank you, council members, uh, for your time. And my name is Monica and I live at 208 West Coolidge. The street is across the street from the project. And I oppose, you know, to this um, project because I support, you know, all the um, neighborhood to here. And Ron, he did a really good job in explaining everything, but the traffic, they will be so bad. And the, it's, it's even a sign that 7th Avenue, you know, in college, they say not to turn 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and it's still cars turning this way for to go on central. If you drive into center from Camelback to before in the school, it's five light to stop there. Just imagine like when the when the schools open like central and Brophy school, you know, in those apartments, all those that will be stuck in there. So I just had to turn around like two days ago because was an Amazon truck there. And the cars, the signs like parking, and even had room for to turn on Central, so I had to turn back and go on to the Seventh Avenue. So I completely, you know, um, oppose this project, and I'm not sure about this, but the, um, uh, but I believe we have 150 signs of the opposition to this project. So I hope this means something to you. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Diane Mahalski. Uh, Diane, are you on the line? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, please proceed. I live at 304 West Campbell Avenue. Um, I join all of my neighbors, Ron Dilly and the rest, that this should be denied because it's not really in a TOD. It's uh, too dense, it's too high, and it will generate traffic and park it, parking problems. Um, what I want to tell you about is 
I filed an ethics complaint against Charlie Jones for his vote in favor of this development on the Alhambra Village Planning Committee, despite having a textbook conflict of interest. Um, I'm not going to talk about the merits of that. I trust y'all to appropriately do the right thing next week. The significance of my complaint is the neighbors have been effectively shut out of the process from the get go. The neighborhood meetings that Mr. Morris talked about attending were ones conducted by Charlie Jones as the purported president of the Pearson Place Historic District. They were not noticed, and neighbors were not allowed to provide any input. They were not allowed to speak at the Alhambra Village Planning Committee, although by that time, several neighbors had approached Charlie Jones to tell him that they opposed the project and they wanted to speak at that meeting, but they weren't allowed to speak because they, they checked the box for attending the meeting and not speaking at the meeting. Then the planning commission just kind of went along with what the Alhambra Village Planning Committee had already done. This was not the way things should be done. It isn't. There was not any kind of due process. There was no meaningful input from the neighborhood. The first time the neighborhood got involved was a couple of weeks ago when Councilwoman Pastor tried to help us resolve this issue by having a settlement um, discussions. Our next speaker is Lena Money. Lena, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Please hello? proceed. Um, yes, hello. I first wanted to start with something that I've noticed in the conversation uh, uh, with the developer. He mentioned that um, he ha they have proposed 20 feet um, uh, step backs uh, as uh, in the conversation on the picture that he showed. But in my understanding and from what I have been following, just as a regular human being uh, from the a few meetings and a few conversations that we had that under the current zoning that they are trying to rezone to, they are not actually allowed or they are not capable of uh, adjusting the setbacks uh, on the property. The only way to adjust any of those is to uh, start with a new application under different zoning or a PUD or something else, but not the current zoning. So what they're trying to uh, say that they're proposing, it will not be able to be adjusted under the zoning that they're trying to apply for. And the other thing that I wanted to talk about is traffic, and I just wanted to share my personal experience uh, as a mother with uh, two kids that I, every morning I have to drive them to school because there is not uh, really a walkable daycare around here. So I have to drive them to 3rd Street in Virginia to Casa Montessori, and the, uh, the closest way for me is to enter through, uh, to exit through Central, which is packed of traffic, and I, I'm always late, even if I leave like 45 minutes earlier, then sometimes I have to reverse and try to exit through 7th Avenue, which is a suicide lane between 6 and 9 a.m., which is also uh, very dangerous to try to exit from that street with two kids in the car. So sometimes I have to actually go to 3rd Avenue and make a whole circle to get out of, of my neighborhood, of my house, to take my kids to school. So I can only imagine how with this enormous building and this um, 200 and more apartments that they are proposing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Owens. Jennifer, are you on the line? Jennifer Owens, Jennifer, are you on the line? Oh my gosh. Okay, hang on. Jennifer? You're muted. I'm here. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, thank you so much um, for letting me speak. And I just wanted to say thank you to Councilwoman Pastor, Mayor Gallego, and the rest of the council. Thank you for um, letting the residents and citizens speak today. Um, I am in opposition of not necessarily the entire apartments being built because we realize that change is coming and Phoenix is the fastest growing city um, in the past year. Um, and so people need to live somewhere. 
it's just it's too big there's the wu code does not meet the criteria that other people have spoken on per the chapter 13 um, that's actually on the city of phoenix, phoenix website um, the second thing i'd like to say is um, with all due respect to mr morris there's a couple of untruths um, that he spoke about including that there are conflicts with the parking issues on third avenue especially because it goes to a 90 degree turn um, right before the pedestrian bridge to cross over the canal um, i actually went out and measured the width of the street and the existing sidewalk that is on the east side of third avenue in the pictures um, that were presented as, as a proposed picture, there were sidewalks on a sidewalk on the west side as well, and there is no sidewalk there. Um, as far as the measurements, if there were to be parking on the street, because it's just not um, a reasonable number of parking spots that's going to be included with the apartment in their enclosed area, realistically, people will park on the street, and given the amount of space um, that's going to take up approximately nine to ten feet for each width for um, each of the parking spots um, and then that's only going to leave about three feet for people to be passing um, there's just not enough space for the Please, parking uh, wrap up and in necessarily in disagreement with the apartment but it's just it's too big and the frontage concession of 48 feet is not the same thing as a concession of only Please, having 48 uh, feet total comments. for the Thank apartments. You. Thank you. Connor Owens is our next speaker. Connor, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Please Can proceed. You hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Women and Men. Uh, I am the son of Jennifer Owens who just spoke and uh, I, I live in this area. I walk my dog, I ride my bike to school. Um, I go down Third Ave every day, twice, three times a day, and I see the size of the street, and I see um, the surrounding apartments that uh, are similar to the sizes and uh, and uh, the likeness of the proposed um, apartments that are being proposed with this zoning. They are proposing to um, develop the canal and to have all, if you saw the proposal pictures, they were all bright, and they had a lot of uh, vegetation, a lot of trees. And I'm just going to say that is not going to happen. In reality, they don't have to follow up with any of that. They are not legally bound. It's a proposal. Any, these things can change. And with the proposed zoning, they could do an entirely different building, technically, if they wanted to. So it's a proposal. Things can change. And so they're saying that they're going to build this many units and this many bedrooms. However, with the proposed zoning, they're, that's unlimited. They can, after they get the zoning, they can do whatever they want. Uh, like, and so that's just going to exasperate, exasperate the um, traffic that we already have. And I run my bike to school. I go on that bike trail. I know that it's dangerous already as we're going down because I know that street is not wide enough for a, a pack of bikers, two cars, and one side only having a sidewalk for pedestrians. It just doesn't make sense. It's not going to, it doesn't fit in the zone, proposed zoning doesn't fit in with the surrounding area. The apartments that are right next to it are R5, which is what the area, this plot is already zoned for, it's R5. It should be R5. The surrounding other three sides are all single family or duplexes. They're not living workspaces. They are not retail. They are not commercial. And the Coolidge and Third Ave, those are not those big streets like Central and Indian Pool. Thank you for your time and have a nice night. Our next speaker is Robert Lottie. Robert, are you on the line? Yes. Hi. Please proceed. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. I live on, my name is Robert Paoletti. I live at 449 West Coolidge. I am about in the middle of the street. And I have not seen anyone do a neighborhood impact study to see how this is going to affect us. No one has done a traffic impact study to see how this will affect us. We are also in a floodplain, and with a subterranean garage, 
What's going to happen with that? According to your person in the city, a um, Ray Dovalina, uh, the infrastructure here is dated back to the 1970s. So with the excess traffic, I am opposed to this, and I yield the rest of my time. Our next speaker is Jeff Ram. Jeff, are you on the line? Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for the time. Um, I joined in the opposition um, to the rezoning um, with, with, my, with my neighbors. I actually live just across the street from the site um, next to Ron, actually next to um, the appellant. Um, you know, I'm all for growth, uh, but just not this, this rezone. My biggest issue is congestion and traffic. Um, you know, living in, in this part of the neighborhood, we're kind of trapped by the canal. Um, we have limited, um, you know, entries and exits from our neighborhood. So to think that people are going to use Central to go north is just, you know, you can't go north on Central. You can only go south um, at Coolidge. And if you were to go south and make a U-turn, you'd have to make a U-turn at Central High School. Um, and that's just super busy with kids and um, you know, it's, it's pretty dangerous too. Um, so the alternative is to take, you know, Hazelwood, Coolidge, Highland, um, to 7th Avenue to go north. Um, and if you want to go south, I mean, you know, just back to the suicide lane is just, you know, scary as it is. So, you know, that's, that's my biggest, um, my biggest reason. Um, and also, you know, it, it's Phoenix is, you know, becoming more and more walkable and I love the canal. It's amazing. I use it all the time. I walk my dog, but it's really nice right now. But in a, a month or two, you know, when it's really hot, you know, I've tried to walk to the light rail from my house and it's just too hot. Like I'll, I'll take a lift like two, three blocks away when it's 115. So yes, it is becoming more and more walkable, but it's just not realistic. And everyone, you know, we all have cars. And so that, you know, that's my biggest, my biggest concern. Um, thank you the time our next speaker is jeremy thacker jeremy are you on the line i am please proceed uh i, I live on 3520 north second avenue just on the other side of the canal uh in campbell and my issues are uh, the same i am in opposition uh of the development uh or the rezoning not the development necessarily but my issues are a little more uh, macro than micro. The four developments that are happening along Central Avenue, um, including this one between Indian School and Camelback, represent enough units that it's almost doubling the population of our neighborhood, which includes Carnation and Pearson Place for me, um, doubling the population. And th these developments are being treated in isolation while all of them are asking for exceptions, but none of them are taking into consideration uh, the increased size of the other developments and density. So the traffic impact studies that are happening are not taking, uh, not looking at the other developments. For instance, the park, the Central Park traffic study, I'd like to read a direct quote um, uh, that was submitted by Whitey Morris. It should be noted that the intersection at Central and Indian School has heavy delays with or without the development. It currently is rated an F in both AM and PM. That is before any of the developments that we're talking about, before adding 1,200 more units. And there's nowhere to go. It's trapped. You've got schools in Indian School Park. You've got the canal. You've got the light rail. There's no way to make it better. So uh, increasing the density of this developments is just a non-starter in my opinion uh, for this to be a livable neighborhood for any of us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ken Waters. Ken, are you on the line? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Hey, uh, before you start the clock, is it possible to get an aerial photo of uh, the neighborhood shot? You can find it on page 644 of the agenda or any one of the slides that was used. Possible and um, we, um, the council practice has been to do only do uh, in the original 10 minutes uh, visuals. So if you could just provide your comments, that would be wonderful. Well, that might be why things are just being slammed through. The vote for this has been 22 to 1, but you've been hearing 
heavy opposition to this. I, I live in Pearson Place. Uh, this project is the worst site plan ever, bringing the same zoning at Central and Indian School to the interior of our neighborhood. Think about that, Central and Indian School to the inside of our neighborhood. It has no, it has no arterial streets. They're just small neighborhood streets. Uh, you know, Channel 3 News did a segment on this uh, a few weeks ago, rightly so, about the opposition. We're pretty heated, but this planning process is breaking down. The audacity of planning staff to recommend Central and Indian School zoning to the interior of a neighborhood is just mind boggling. And I was listening to uh, Mr. Stevenson talk when he presented this thing, um, <clears throat> you know, talking about the intensification of this corridor area up here. And it dawned on me to ask the question, was Canalscape a Trojan horse to intensify non-arterial streets in the interior of the middle, middle of a neighborhood? This is just a travesty in, in planning and zoning. I, I can't believe it. Um, you know, we're speaking to really an audience of one. Uh, Councilwoman Pastor ran as a champion of neighborhoods when she originally ran in 2013. And these projects are just getting rubber stamped in one after another. I mean, I don't see how that's a champion for neighborhoods when you can hear this much opposition. You know, you're injecting a lot of traffic to the interior of the neighborhood. This isn't out on the, the periphery of Central and Camelback or 7th Avenue. We're trapped in here, you know. So all this traffic is being funneled to the inside of this neighborhood. And I'm strongly in opposition to this. And the whole process is just looking like a, a steamroller, 22 to two vote so far, and you can hear this much opposition. So I appreciate uh, the time, thank you. Mayor, I believe that was the last uh, speaker on this item, and then we could return to Mr. Morris. All right, Mr. Morris, you have uh, two minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members. I appreciate this. Obviously, this is a very sensitive issue for the neighborhood and we are responding to those issues. And we have since our original neighborhood meeting back in September, we have met consistently uh, virtually through the neighborhood association. Uh, I understand there are difficulties in the virtual world, but we have made ourselves available in other ways as well. It, it, in terms of the appropriateness of this site, it is in the center of the Uptown TOD. Please do not be confused or, or misinformed by the opposition. I don't know if it's intentional or not, but the misquoting and misreading of the city's plans is very frustrating to the applicant. And we have to recognize that this is an R5 site as it stands today. We are asking for no more additional stories. It is still a four story building either way. And where there are differences in the development standards, we have conceded that the development standards of the R5, where it touches the neighborhood, will be adopted. In terms of traffic, we are offering more parking than R5. In terms of existing, we're talking about an existing office site. And in fact, as you look at the traffic study, which has been per performed, you will see that the AM traffic, there is a difference in 15 cars in the AM, in the AM peak. As we look at the setbacks, which have been significant to the neighborhood, we have agreed to the 20 foot setback so that there is no difference between the R5 and the walkable urban code, which is entirely appropriate for this area. In terms of neighborhood outreach, it does not stop with just sending a letter. We have had four meetings with Pearson Place alone in order to come to site plan modifications and changes that are appropriate. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Councilwoman Pastor. Ellen, um, I would like to look at the R3, R5 and uh, and the and the Wu code uh, T55 in the sense of the differences in um, 
parking. Okay, um, Council Mayor, Council and Pastor, would you uh, like to go to that or would you uh, like to talk about some of the background um, uh, uptown policy stuff that was, that was raised? I guess tell, uh, discuss the uptown policy that was raised in order that I can then uh, speak about these items just so that the, they have, uh, that there's knowledge on, on those pieces. In particular, great. the TOD overlay. Uh, great, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to have a, a couple of uh, um, maps put up here so that we can uh, have that discussion and then we can uh, put up uh, the, the table to compare that. So I believe you should be looking at a map. This is right in the Uptown uh, TOD district and you see the boundaries outlined in the dark uh, black line corridor or the uh, dark orange line is uh, Central Avenue and Camelback where you're following the light rail line. The white circles are the station stops. You can see also the Grand Canal. The site is clearly within the Uptown uh, TOD district adopted council policy plan. Uh, there can be no mistake about that. This is the boundary. You see this boundary throughout uh, the plan. It's within it um, and within the, the 10 minute, uh, the portion of it's within the 10 minute walk shed of, uh, of the uh, light rail line uh, with the station stop um, uh, that is shown here in white. On the next slide, please Ariel. This one uh, might be a little bit uh, harder to see, but you see in this middle diagram where it says land use element and there are various uh, shades of purple, uh, you can see the cutout is the exact same shape as I just showed you because it's the uptown uh, TOD policy area. And what this map is showing you is the uh, conscientious effort that staff undertook with the community when this plan was adopted to show areas where uh, we wanted to see uh, redevelopment take place in the darker uh, purple color areas and areas where we did not wanna see that in the lighter colors. So you see the lighter area uh, shown in this area around Pearson Place. If you're looking on the, the, uh, the south side of, you can see the Grand Canal, that is the blue line shown right uh, through there in kind of the middle part of the plan. You see that dark purple color going over is the edge of this property and it's right at that interface where the edge of the property is adjacent to the area where uh, as part of the planning process uh, the community and staff identified that in Pearson Place uh, that lower purple color that's where we don't want to see uh, any intensification but this area where the dark purple is because it was already zoned R5 along with those other parcels that are along the light rail line on Central Avenue are shown for redevelopment as part of this uh, adopted plan. And the next slide. And, and for this one, uh, we will go to uh, Ron's uh, presentation because he has a, a, um, a map that, that shows it. One second. Uh, the, the, the TOD interim overlay was uh, an overlay zoning district that was put in place prior to the construction of the, the light rail line. And it was done uh, as a manner to uh, work with the uh, FTA on funding for the, light, the initial light rail line to show that the city as part of its commitment was willing to uh, work with property owners to enact regulations that really were focused on limiting auto type uses. Uh, and so if you look at what's contained in it, there's a lot of things about limiting the type of uses for uh, drive-throughs, large car washes, auto uh, you know, dealerships, those types of uses that are really dominated by automobiles 
so that those could be phased out over time as the light rail was ultimately constructed and built. And so that's really what the overlay does. And that's why it says interim transit oriented zoning overlay. It doesn't mean that the area was never to change. It was just put in to help with that initial funding with the idea being, uh, even if you went back and looked at when it was adopted, there would be future planning processes that eventually became the reInvent Phoenix process to establish what type of uh, zoning and what development was appropriate in this area in the future. And you can see that as part of that uptown planning process that includes that area, that's where that discussion uh, you know, took place and why it shows that parcel for uh, a redevelopment in that darker purple color. Um, I would just note that there's been lots of discussion about it, that type of, of um, designation is only appropriate for, for major intersections. I, I would note that the intersection across the street at Central and Indian School is a T622 that allows uh, 250 feet of height. Um, and so it was, the, the T55 was what was uh, desired by the property owner on that other corner not necessarily uh, what was uh, the only stated use within uh, that parcel, but that's what the, the property owner desired at the time at that northwest uh, corner. And the, the real reason that the T55 uh, was shown as appropriate in redevelopment here is the existing zoning is already R5, and so it allows by right, without any public hearing, 48 feet in, in building height and 43.5 dwelling units per acre. And so, that decision uh, you know, to grant that zoning predates uh, you know, all of the current council members being on the council and that's what sets up a property right that is there today and so uh, as part of redevelopment of that to the slightly more intense T55, that was, was deemed appropriate as part of that. Uh, with that, Councilwoman Pastor, did you have anything about, more about the big picture that you wish me to address or I can move into the, the site specific um, uh, items. Well, I, I would like to go into site specific items. We still have a another long meeting, a lo, a, another two hour meeting. So let's just enter that space. So I have a que the question I have is an R3 and R5, what it's currently zoned. Um, maximum height there is 48 feet, am I correct? You are correct. Okay, so if we, if uh, a community asked for 30 feet, <laughs> is that possible? Uh, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, that would not be possible to require uh, a property owner to only build two stories 30 feet on a property that is already zoned to allow four stories and 48 feet. Okay, because I my understanding, it, it, the request can be asked, but more than likely uh, a developer won't do that because they already have uh, the property rights and the height for 48 feet. Mayor, Councilman Pastor, you are you are correct. Uh, you know, the city could ask for for anything, but under the, the way zoning works in the law, uh, a property owner is not at all likely to, uh, to build two stories 30 feet on a property that is zoned to allow 48 feet in height. Okay. My next question is on the setbacks. Um, I have heard uh, from the neighborhood uh, regarding setbacks. So my understanding with an R3 and an R5, right now it's a 20-foot set setback. With the proposal um, that is in front of us, they're asking for a 12 and 10 feet setback. And that's the difference uh, between the R3 and R5 and the T55. Mayor, uh, Councilman Pastor, you are correct. Okay. I am, I am interested in the increased traffic. Um, I have heard that, and at this moment, uh, donor network, um, currently, I'm not sure, there's zone R3 and R5, which means um, 
their parking, I don't know what the maximum of the parking spaces are for that area. I think it's 318. Mayor, uh, Council, um, Woman Pastor, the, the parking requirements are based upon what a, uh, an actual use is. And so in this case, uh, I don't know what the parking is for the existing donor network that is, is on site, uh, but uh, what is there, they would have had to meet parking requirements and for any new redevelopment of, of the site, they will have to meet the parking requirements as well. Um, and so what, uh, what you see here uh, on this slide is a, is a comparison of parking supply relative to what uh, could be permitted in the middle in the T55 uh, district, which would be uh, as low as 287 parking spaces. The proposal by the applicant is 303 spaces. And then what you see in this first column is uh, what staff had put together based upon a, a configuration that was exactly the same number of units um, within a, uh, that their, pro their proposal is within the R5 district. Uh, however, as you heard from, from Mr. Morris, and he had calculations that showed a unit mix the city actually determines parking based upon a unit mix of the number of uh, efficiency units, one uh, bedroom units, two bedroom and three bedroom units. And so all of that would be permitted to be defined by the applicant if they were to develop under the R5 zoning. And then based upon that unit mix, we would derive a required minimum parking number. And uh, what Mr. Morris provided if that would be their unit mix that they would come in under R5, that would be the required amount of parking. Um, and I believe that the, the number you know, of parking there was uh, less than what they are proposing to do under the walkable urban code um, designation. Okay, can you tell me in plain language? <laughs> I, got, I got it, but I think those that don't understand um, and listening, uh, uh, Mayor, Council Members, uh, one second. Uh, we are pulling up the the PowerPoint uh, from Mr. Morris's presentation to show uh, exactly um, what they are showing. Uh, and so you see that uh, Mr. Morris, as part of his presentation, uh, put forward this, um, uh, which showed 246 parking spaces under the R5 zoning uh, designation uh, if they were to go forward and develop that. And again, that's because the, the R5 district limits the amount of dwelling units where the walkable urban code does not, but the R5 district, because it allows substantially the same amount of height would allow for a mix of two and three bedroom units that would derive a different parking calculation uh, depending on what actually would get built and proposed by a developer. And that's why this table is more accurate than the generic one that staff extrapolated with no information uh, other than exactly what the applicant proposed because that's all we had at the time. So this, the 246 is more uh, accurate number relative to the R5 parking requirements. Okay, and the T55 would be 278. So it would increase? It would, it would increase. Um, and then what the applicant is proposing is 303 spaces because they are not proposing to avail themselves of the parking reduction that is permitted within T55 because they are so close to a light rail stop. Okay, understood. And then I heard about the flood, uh, the floodplain. Can you talk about that? Because I've heard that uh, throughout this whole conversation too. So uh, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, uh, 
The, the infrastructure does date back to the, the 1970s and earlier uh, on a number of these as uh, a resident who talked to, uh, to Ray Dovalina about. Uh, however, whenever a, a new project is coming in, they're required to update that uh, infrastructure and to meet current drainage uh, requirements. And the city has uh, more updated floodplain maps and more stringent uh, requirements that this project will have to meet if it's approved and goes forward and gets built. So that will take it out of the floodplain and address the, the flooding issues. Okay, all right. Um, our, I don't know if any of my colleagues have questions. Uh, while we still have the public hearing open, do any council uh, members have questions, particularly for our, the applicant or appellant? I, seeing none, I am going to go ahead and close the public hearing. And then uh, we will turn to Councilwoman Pastor for a motion. So um, I have, it's been very difficult during COVID uh, to really, um, really understand uh, all the pieces that had been going on uh, with this project. So I wanna thank Ron, uh, Adam and Dylan, and Nancy, and Diane and others that uh, got actively involved in this project. And uh, I have heard uh, from you and have uh, dug in and did a lot of research on this project and looked at all the different plans. And so um, I would like to thank you for that. Um, I also understand and understand that uh, there's a fear of uh, more traffic. Um, there will be traffic because uh, that building will be built um, and it's not going to increase to a point where uh, it's being saturated. If it is, and if it does happen, I will uh, bring in the traffic department, the streets department, to work with the neighborhood on, on all the elements of traffic. My motion is to remand the request back to the Planning Commission and re-advertise as a plan unit development, a PUD, for the May 6th Planning Commission hearing and the May 19th City Council formal meeting as a public hearing item. The PUD at the minimum shall address all the existing staff stipulations and the following items best up based on the discussions with the neighborhood. The maximum building height of 48 feet for all buildings, except for the parking or garage along east and south property line, which will shall which will shall be which shall be limited to 56 feet. A minimum setback of 20 feet between the curb and the building and the building faces on both Coolidge Street and 3rd Avenue. A maximum of 210 dwelling units permitted on the site. A restriction of vehicular access on 3rd Avenue. Identification of applicable frontage types for 3rd Avenue landscape and design provisions to address the neighborhood's privacy considerations along 3rd Avenue and Coolidge Street. In addition, permitting the parking throughout the neighborhood. That is my motion. Second. second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second from Councilwoman Stark. The motion would remand the case back to the Planning Commission and give them very specific directives about um, Councilwoman's priorities. Do any council members have questions or comments? All right, roll call. Garcia. Yes. 
Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8-0. Thank you. So by a vote of 8-0, to zero, this uh, item will return to the Planning Commission in May with very specific directions about next steps. Thank you to all who have been involved and, and working for um, success in this area. We next move to our final agenda item, which is item 116, consideration of four citizen petitions. Um, we do have uh, 14 individuals to address the council, and uh, I will turn to Matthew to uh, call the public uh, for their comments. Thank you, Mayor. Our first speaker is Dominic Bonelli. Dominic, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. All right, so I'm speaking today in support of these four petitions, starting with A. Uh, we need an independent ethics investigation of the TRU and Chief Williams, and the key word here is independent. Uh, since AB 15, ABC 15's politically charged series, the police have faced four, quote, outside reviews. Uh, but these reviews have been widely ineffective because they come from within the system. Uh, the investigation you cited in the agenda for this meeting uh, from 21 CP Solutions LLC, at its core, promotes policing, and police cannot police the police. You all know what an in-group and an out-group is, right? Police look after police because they share the same interests. Uh, they belong to the same in-group, believing that they are holding the line of order amidst chaos. And if you've been listening to any of the shared experiences today, you would know that's simply not true. Um, you also said in the agenda that uh, these petitions are based on allegations and opinions, so let's talk facts. Uh, every week we see PPD's corruption go deeper and deeper. We know that the TRU specifically targeted black activists. We know that they've been shutting down protests with Israeli military style tactics. We know that they've arrested hundreds of protesters without probable cause. We know they have a racist agenda. Uh, last time we discussed these petitions, Chief Kurtenbach tried justifying the TRU with an anecdote, talking about how the TRU suppressed protests over SB 1070, which is an incredibly racist piece of legislature back in 2010. Uh, we know all these awful things. So what are you going to do about it? Uh, for petition B, all I really have to say about that is just reap what you've sown. You know, you've continued to stick up for PPD, so just pay the cost. Uh, moving along to petition D, what I have to say about this is cops lie, and cops lie routinely. Ask any public defender. Any public defender will tell you this. Uh, they lied in my police report last year, uh, and they've lied in hundreds of police reports last year with copy-paste probable cause statements and fabricated evidence. These are all facts. Um, again, since you say that you you know you want facts, let's talk direct evidence. Um, I mentioned. Our next speaker is Vanessa DiCarlo. Vanessa, are you on the line? Vanessa. It it appears we may not have. Did we even have. Oh. Uh, please Can you hear me? start again, Vanessa. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, it is unconscionable that we even have to create these petitions. Um, we've been coming to these meetings, and I've been attending in solidarity with Black and Brown leadership and those that are directly impacted specifically to voice um, the concerns of those uh, that can't be here because these meetings are hours and hours long and inaccessible, and that the fact that we even have to create these petitions for you to listen when there is so much, an overwhelming amount of not only evidence of corruption and collusion with your, in your own police department in true, but also um, nationally, we understand these issues are systemic and structural and we need you to listen. And um, even the me media has made this so obvious uh, what we have been saying all along, you can see this on these on the politically charged uh, ABC 15 series, and they're doing what they're designed to do. That's why reformist measures are not effective. The police are intentionally killing, caging, and silencing Black people, as what Black leadership and those and organizers have been 
taking to the streets and protesting about. And the response is to then do more of caging and, and killing black and brown folks. Um, why did we have to beg to get these demands even heard? And even when we begged, only a handful were deemed worth your time. It is your job to address these demands. Do your job. It is not just a job for white people. There are people who really need black and brown individuals really need you to come to the table and make some different decisions. I've seen you as political, um, as folks and pol politicians on Facebook, on social media, able to speak out, able to, um, you know, be brave with your voice and choose courage over comfort. And then when it comes to, to issues that really affect black um, and brown, indigenous, disabled kids, people. Our next speaker is Anissa Groves. Anissa, are you on the line? Anissa? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, please proceed. Thank you. Your response in the agenda to these petitions is to say we already have a system in place for this. This is exactly why we had to bring them here. These existing systems do not provide a path to justice, safety, or accountability in any way. You could personally help every impacted person go through the existing process of submitting a claim and it wouldn't make any difference. And there is no amount of incremental reform you can do to these systems that will fix the problem. You actually have the power right now to end police violence. You just won't use it. But right now we are just asking you to begin repairing a small portion of the harm done by PPD and the county attorney's office and to take some initial steps toward holding them accountable. You know you can count on us to keep showing up, so you might as well work with us and for us. Anyone paying attention right now can see the shift that's happening across the country. Public safety is being transformed, even if we can't see that here in Phoenix yet. Cities everywhere are reducing the power of the police and reinvesting in communities. You can join in now or later, but these changes are inevitable because the people are powerful beyond measure, and we are very determined to see through the creation of a truly safe and just world. I hope you will take one step today to move with us, move forward with me in the demands of these petitions and be part of that change. Our next speaker is Hannah Heyman. Hannah, are you on the line? Hannah? The people of the city were forced to submit these citizens' petitions because you are so committed to acting against the will of the people. The folks who wrote these petitions laid out everything so clearly. You didn't have to do any work at all to respond to the needs of directly impacted people. You must implement the petitions as written, not what you've written in your agenda, which was condescending. You sat and patted yourselves on the back for supporting false transparency and accountability for the cops a couple hours ago. But we have here evidence of your own lack of accountability and transparency. Reparations must be paid to the victims of the white supremacist police force that you employ to guard your tower of desolations. There has been a concerted effort between the police the county attorney and the city manager to destroy people's lives with false felony charges. They deserve reparations. People are struggling to find jobs because of the false felonies. They're struggling to find housing. If the risk management fund you refer to really is for reparations, why aren't you helping the people that have been harmed to access those funds? You say you have policies to hold police accountable for lying, but then why haven't you fired the cops who were shown to have lied under oath on ABC 15? We all saw the footage of the cops brazenly lying on the stands, but they're still on your payroll because you support their lives and the harm that they've caused. Why else would you keep them on the payroll? I see what's in your hearts when you all sit here and smile when, while we're called racists for pointing out the white supremacy that is posted on social media every day, for the violence spoken here at every meeting, for the genocidal policies that are supported here. You scold our tone while you sit at the table with this rabid beast. How can you sit at this table, Betty? How can you justify this to yourself, Laura? Have you forgotten the people you used to organize with, Carlos? Do you still have a heart, Kate? Please choose to join us today. I believe that you all do have the hearts to do so. Please show us that you stand with the community and implement the petitions as they were written. Our next speaker is Chelsea Hickok. Chelsea, are you on the line? I am, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, please proceed. Great. So city council, you've already let us down today by approving the MOU with plea. And for some reason, it's okay for South to call us crazy, yet we're asked to remain civil. And let me say crazy for caring about people, crazy for simply caring. 
Those of you on the public safety and justice subcommittee know the citizens petition started with nine demands Then you cut us down to seven and now only four of our demands remain, which makes me think that Carlos, Betty, Deb and Felda don't care that much about public safety or justice. However, these remaining demands are an opportunity for council to do the right thing for your community and to stop pretending like there's nothing you can do for us, which is what you said when we demanded Jerry Williams be fired. It is vital you approve these items to begin to build trust back between the council and the community, because let me assure you, you have lost that trust. It is your job to work to earn it back. We need an independent, as in not run by retired law enforcement, investigation into PPD and the violent tactical response unit. We need reparations to be paid to all victims of police violence and all those slapped with politically motivated charges. And we need enforceable guidelines and disciplinary measures to use when police behave exactly as we already know they will. Protect your community. Vote yes on all of the items of our citizens petition. Thank you. Our next speaker is Will Knight. Will, are you on the line? Did you unmute me? Uh, Will, we're getting some echo. If you could turn down your audio just a bit. And, and now you're very quiet, so if you could speak up a bit. You're on the wrong device. You unmuted the wrong device. But can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can hear you now. Okay. I'm less upset uh, than most of the folks here about what was written in response to my petition because that's what I told you the first day when you heard this. This is not extraordinary. For years, members of this council have opposed external oversight because of the supreme confidence members of this committee have in existing oversight, like supervisors, internal affairs, professional standards, all of that. But at the same time, we've seen officers get caught falsifying reports, probable cause statements, testimony, and there's no oversight, there's no discipline. So the existing mechanisms clearly don't matter. These things are true together at the same time. The only way that's possible is if existing oversight does not have adequate guidance from you. I wanna thank Chief Kurtenbach actually for highlighting my point and the folks who wrote the response for the city with crystal clarity. <laughs> what Chief Kurtenbach said last month was that the police department has no way of knowing or even investigating the misconduct that I'm referencing. And that's extraordinary. Even if we set aside the allegations about false probable cause statements, which are on a public docket, false reports that are literally on the chief computer, what he just said was that our police department is too incompetent to investigate perjury. That or he proved my point that the police will never adequately investigate or discipline themselves. My petition asks you to prove me wrong. I said that from the get-go. So the report that was written to you means nothing. I asked you to prove me wrong. I asked you to fix this by giving clear guidance about how to investigate and how to discipline. And I specifically request right now an opportunity to respond to any witness who challenges what I'm testifying about today like Chief Kurtenbach did last time. After five hours, after canceling a medical appointment, I believe I deserve that dignity. Thank you, Council. Our next speaker is Kelly Clock. Kelly, are you on the line? Kelly, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Okay, I am here in support of these four petitions. If the existing system of liability claims was working to bring justice for people being politically prosecuted, we wouldn't be here demanding reparations. When the most violent police department in the country is colluding with the prosecutor's office to ruin your life and throw you in prison for decades, how can you really be expected to feel safe filing a claim about that kind of harm under that kind of legal pressure? Reparations must be paid and you need to make that happen. 
for you who want to keep your seat or for who is going to take your seat, you have to pick up more and figure out the dangers of the delusions of white supremacy and police legitimacy that our society and most people subscribe to. Myself and many people calling today are also talking to our families, friends, and neighbors about these systemic issues. And with each person and meeting and vote, we will change this. Vote yes. Our next speaker is Benjamin Lewis. Benjamin, are you on the line? I sure think I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Thank you so much. Um, the problem here, as I see it, is that we've still got trust issues. And what plea put forward in the MOU earlier today and what y'all voted yes on really hamstrings a lot of the inflection points brought up in the original nine points of this citizen's petition. And the four points that remain here today, I have to say I fully support. Carlos said this on item 41, we shouldn't treat our police officers as if they are the same as any other city employees. With the special considerations we offer them based on the risk of their job, we have to recognize an elevated level of responsibility. If we trust them with a gun in a system that can only justify that gun's use in self-defense, we have to have a process in place that ensures that they don't abuse that tool or level it indiscriminately against their fellow Phoenicians. Plea thinks officers are at risk enough to need riot gear, battle armor, and tanks while we, the community, are horrified by the police violence and believe that we should be able to hold police accountable when they intentionally or neglectfully kill one of us or our neighbors. Accountability is transparency plus process. Attachment D is an essential bedrock on building community trust. We need a better process than the one that we have. In addition, PD should also pay their own legal settlements. If they can't be trusted to follow the laws they are sworn to uphold, then they should not be guaranteed a transfer to where and a pension for what, much less an open checkbook when they keep messing up. But that's exactly what most of you did by voting to approve the MOU in its current form. With regards to attachments A and B, we need the Phoenix Police Department to financially responsible for their own failings. Let me say that correctly, because it's important. We need the Phoenix Police Department to be financially responsible for their own failures. Phoenix PD must pay wrongful death and harassment suits out of their own budget. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tina Luna. Tina, are you on the line? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, we're working way harder than any of you to make sure that these life and death topics are addressed on the agenda. It's your job to represent the public. It's your job to push back against the idea that there is enough evidence to, to hold the PPD accountable for for their endless violence. You all should be pushing back against the reports coming from the city management. This shows a lack of support for true community safety and how little you value black lives. And a lot of comments were made earlier about how hard police jo their job is, how dangerous it is, how all of the 911 calls and everything that they have to respond to. And, you know, if you would just open your minds and realize that if, if, if the police were defunded and people were housed and people had health care and people had mental health care and education and access to job training and, and work, there would be less need for police. There would be less violence in the street. There would be less chaos. There would be, everybody would be safer. The way things are right now, the white community is safe and the black and brown indigenous community is not safe. The way the police treat us white people. I had a cop stop me for speeding. I was speeding. He didn't give me a ticket. I said, oh, just go ahead and give me a ticket. I know what I, he goes, I thought we were friends. That's what the police officer said to me. Talk to any 
person of color, police do not make those kind of statements to them. Our next speaker is Helen Mendizabo. Helen, are you on the line? I am. Can everyone hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, everyone. We've seen a step-by-step -step investigation with ABC News 15 and how Phoenix police has continuously lied under oath. And you know what? That's not really an opinion. It's a fact with proof and evidence. We've been working really hard, almost harder than any of you guys, just to make these needs be heard. You've all heard this. You know why it matters. It's also really kind of difficult to sit by and get called crazy by council members. Are you really representing your constituents or just those that uphold systemic violence? It's your job to reflect and be uncomfortable when a change, um, when we have changes to make and there's evidence of how violent Phoenix police police is do you guys support justice or just police that's been lying under oath listen to those of us that have been directly impacted by this um, I yield the rest of my time our next speaker is Karen Olson Karen are you on the line hello I am can you hear me yes ma'am please proceed hi um, thank you for this time. Um, I'm going to speak to you all and I hope you'll listen. I'm not going to hold my breath. As we have all been here collectively for six hours, I know council, you think that we haven't been, but we are here. We are listening. We are showing up. And I would like to directly communicate this to Sal Basicio. We are not saying that people that choose the profession of police are not worthy of being taken into account. They are humans, just like we all are humans. However, when we put a collective on this police force, it becomes dangerous to some and protective to others. I'm going to let you all read these beautiful petitions that my fellow citizens of Phoenix have put together because their words reflect more than mine will say right here, right now. However, we are not trying to say that these individual people are not worthy of living. We are trying to say that being a police officer does not, police officer does not make your life more valuable than anybody else's because of the systemic racism that we all live under. We need to wake up collectively. We need to choose differently. We have opportunity. We can change. We can grow at any time. You have this power. You have this choice. You need to decide to act differently. We are not here to vilify individual police officers. We are here to vilify the police force. Choose differently. Our next speaker is Patricia Paglucia. Patricia, Patricia are you on the line? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, please proceed. Thank you so much, Council Members Stark, Pastor, Guardardo, Garcia, Nowakowski, and Mayor Kate. Whew, we've made it through a very long night and we're finally at our petitions. You know, we offered nine of these petitions at the Land Use and Livability. And unfortunately, you only motioned and voted for these four pretty softballs to be heard. We understand what's been, you know, proven clearly that you don't take seriously our concerns of the black and brown community members that have been speaking out consistently at each of these meetings. Sal is calling us crazy and the rest of you are ignoring us and or rushing through the comments. It looks like you all are protecting, protecting PPD's image and reputation instead of the community members that Phoenix police are harming. Have you all seen the news reports on the political prosecutions? Do you care at all about human beings more than the rules you insist we follow? Does it not bother you that Phoenix Police Department celebrated their violence with neo-Nazi rhetoric? 
We are not name calling or being disrespectful when we say Phoenix Police Department is full of racist, violent neo-Nazis. We are literally stating verifiable facts that have been on the news for months. So these petitions that you all are quick to dismiss, of course, should be passed today. People deserve reparations. It should be made clear that police cannot lie under oath, which they do. I want to know if you support victims for being compensated from the devastation that Phoenix police causes, or do you completely condone everything that Phoenix police has done? Whose side are you on? And will any of you say anything about the fact that Phoenix police has been proven to lie under oath? Our next speaker is Marcus Reed. Marcus, are you on the line? I'm sorry, it appears that Marcus is no longer on the line. So our next speaker is Jessica Schmidt. Jessica, are you on the line? It, it appears that uh, Jessica is also no longer on the line. So our next speaker would be Courtney Tilly Bisbee. Courtney, are you on the line? Um, yes, this crazy, wacky racist is on the line, as Councilman Sal called us, which is absolutely ridiculous that he, um, what policies and procedures and rule violations um, are you going to hold him accountable to? Um, you didn't hold you don't hold the police Phoenix Police Department accountable. You don't hold your own council members accountable to any standards but you do hold everybody else accountable to the rules and policies and procedures. So it seems a little bit hypocrite, like a little bit of a hypocrisy, especially coming into six hours of us caring about our community and having more empathy than any of you sitting there tonight. So let's just clear that right up. I absolutely support the four petitions going forward. Um, and I think the policies and procedures, if they've been in place for 40 years, I think things have changed, so it's probably going to be somewhat outdated and time to revisit them. I don't think that would be a shocker. Um, pretty much common sense. And I'm tired of my tax dollars, and we are going to display and show and get people out to vote and no longer have the tax dollars to support your little charity projects, which is your Phoenix Police Department family, and also paying for all the misconduct cases the abuse cases and the violence. My tax dollars shouldn't be going for that. The police department should be going and covering their own. There's no profession that can have that type of misconduct and those mistakes and still be practicing their profession. Just the Phoenix Police Department. And because they have buddies like you guys covering up for them, they will never be held accountable. And that needs to change. You have the fox guarding the hen house and you guys are the fox. You guys protect them and it's disgusting. You should be representing your people and your constituents, and instead you're in bed with the police department, and that will change these elections, and I pray the FBI and no longer Trump will come in and investigate. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Venable. Elizabeth, are you on the line? Yes. Hi, um, I just want to say I support all four remaining petitions as reforms for so long due. I believe in oversight and accountability. And as somebody who has been seriously injured by police department, um, I just want to say that I hope that sometimes you take these issues seriously and don't just sweep them aside and i don't have a lot more to say i've been talking to you all day so um i'll yield my time mayor i believe that was our last public speaker i'm just going to check with our i.t department and uh, they've confirmed that was our last speaker on this item all right Council comments. Council, and I'm uh, Councilmember Garcia. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you to the folks who stayed and waited this long, as we all have. Um, 
I we know we had some comments on uh, and subcommittee. I would have preferred for us to have a better forum to be able to have a conversation about uh, these issues, which I think are very serious. They were highlighted in the ABC 15 <clears throat> uh, reporting that was done over the last couple of months. Um, so with that, I'd like to motion to approve uh, the four citizen petitions. Mayor? Um, and should we wait and see if we have a second on that motion? Yes. Yes, Mayor, they do need a second. Okay. Okay. Um, do we have a second? Okay, I believe motion dies for a lack of a second. Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. I, I want to make a motion to deny item 116. As the staff report explains, these citizen petitions are already being addressed. Petition second. is being handled through various second. external investigations. B and C, the city has existing risk management fund and notice of claim process to handle these claims. In petition D, the city has existing policies and disciplinary measures for all employees that specifically prohibit employees from providing false information in connection with their duties. Second. We have a motion from Vice Mayor Williams and a second from Councilman Waring. Council comments? Of Councilman Guardado. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just have a, a question for, for Ed. Ed, um, can you just give us an overview? I, I know we've been talking about some of these issues and if you could just give us a little bit of, of an overview of what is it that city management has done um, to be able to address some of these issues or some of these concerns that have been laid out here today or in the last few months with these petitions? Yes, thank you, Councilman Guardado for that question. So we are currently have an outside law firm procured to do two separate investigations. The first one has to do with the uh, challenge coins that are reported to have been issued after the 2017 uh, uh, protest response from the police department. Uh, and the, those challenge coins, the officers involved and, and the uh, basis of the hate speech that was indicated on the coins. That same law firm is uh, doing a separate investigation for uh, city management of the, um, the connection between the uh, protest arrests and uh, the subsequent prosecution by the Maricopa County Attorney's Office under uh, gang-related charges. So. We, we can't investigate MCAO, but we are, have the outside firm is investigating the role of the Phoenix Police Department and the individual officers and what, what went on and how the relationship between Phoenix Police and the Maricopa County Attorney's Office transpired, <clears throat> which will also include the questions about the testimony in those cases. Um, the third, uh, the third one, to answer your question, is a bigger systemic review of the TRU, their tactics, the policies, and the training of that group. That is being conducted by a group the council authorized us to hire, 21 CP Solutions, which is an outside firm that will conduct a review and um, give a report and any recommendations for changes that should be made to the tactics and the pro policies and practices and training of the uh, tactical response unit in our downtown operations area. So that, that's a summary of where we stand at the moment. And can you give us a timetable? When should the in investigation and in, in the review be done? Sure, thank you for that. Uh, we asked 21 CP Solutions to have an initial report on their review of the TRU uh, within 60 days. We're probably, I think we're about 15 days into that timeline. Ballard Spars, two investigations. It, it's the, the developing the timeline is a little more difficult because 
of the number of people that they're interviewing and um, there was some delay in the release of some grand jury testimony and some of those things. So my, uh, my expectation is that those should be done within the next 60 days or at least a status report, a viable status report in that time period. Great. I mean, the only thing I would I would ask it is that as we continue to get these updates, that we can also get updates at the public safety subcommittee, just so that we can keep folks updated on where the review is going and, and where the investigation is going as well. Understood. Thank you. Councilmember Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think these are, are really serious allegations. Obviously, Ed's taking the steps to have other investigations. I would really want us to consider either a policy session, policy session, and again, it's you, policy session or work study session to look into these uh, practices and the policies that we have. We literally have officers lying on the stand and the whole world watched these videos. Um, we had the unit with the neo-Nazi coins. I, I, I do think there's, you know, maybe these citizen petitions aren't the way to move forward, but I really do think we need to look at policies to make sure that this isn't happening. We do have a responsibility to the people that our employees have uh, impacted. We have people who were falsely charged with felonies that may have lost jobs, that have had consequences because of the deception of some of our employees. I do think there's responsibility there, both to make sure that those folks are taken care of, but also that we make sure it doesn't happen again. I have never heard of an officer being, and I might be wrong, and Ed, correct me if I'm wrong, of an officer being disciplined for lying or uh, you know, doing what we saw in the last couple of months. I don't think that was the first time it happened. And so I wanna, when these reports are done, I expect all of us to talk about it, not just in public safety, but I would want to have a public dialogue about both what the discipline is going to look like, but also what systematic policies are we going to change to make sure that this doesn't happen again. It has been an embarrassment. Some of you all may not see it that way, but to, and if you haven't watched the ABC 15 reporting, to my colleagues, I, I really hope you do watch them um, to know that we're talking about. Some folks on the council might just think people are crazy, um, but those videos do not lie. We are literally have evidence of our officers um, wrongfully testifying against folks and making things up. And so I guess it sounds like, you know, these petitions are gonna move forward uh, but, Mayor, I would ask you in, in your position to please think about a policy or a work study session where we can look, um, you know, whether these reports are coming back, the investigations are coming back, but really look as a council um, to the responsibility we have to make sure that these things don't happen again. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any additional council member comments? Mayor. Uh, Mayor, I have a question for Ed. Uh, we'll go to Councilman Nowakowski, followed by Councilwoman Pastor. All right, thank you. So, Ed, I've heard um, individuals address that this should be going to Public Safety Subcommittee. Can you explain the process set for public um, petitions? Uh, certainly, Councilman. So, the process for public petitions is that when they're presented and uh, properly to the City Council at a formal agenda, they are then agendized with the Land Use and Livability Subcommittee, which has a review of those, and that subcommittee uh, forwards or tables or, or defeats uh, the, the petitions for uh, pr presentation of the full council. So in this case, the petitions were presented uh, at the City Council meeting on March 17th. They went to the Land Use and Livability Sub, I'm sorry, when were they presented? Were they presented on February 7th, on March 17th? They were, and then the Land Use and Livability Subcommittee heard the petitions that were there and forwarded these four. So, uh, Councilman Nokowski, that is the process the council follows. Thank you, Ed, for that clarification. 
Councilwoman Pastor. Yes, uh, my question is about uh, the petition D. Um, and I would like to know on petition D, if this even exists, Ed, well, I, I see the, the second, second piece that we have policies, but what is it that we would be able to do uh, to look at uh, petition D? Well, the, so it's asking to um, establish enforceable guidelines and meaningful disciplinary measures to prevent uh, false information. So I think what, what we're saying is those, those rules and guidelines already exist in several places in city's personnel rules, in the city's ethics policy, and very specifically in the police department's operational orders. Uh, so, and, and then in, as, as in a response to Councilwoman Wardado, in, in the case, this specific case, where there are allegations of Phoenix police lying in this, uh, in the exchange between Phoenix police and the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, those, that is specifically being reviewed by our outside counsel um, because those, those allegations are very specific and very serious. So based on that, that review, if officers or employees are found to have lied, there is then a process of discipline for that uh, for that evidence of lying. Okay, so I, I understand. Okay, so yes, there is a process. We do have uh, items. I guess my sec further question or second question is, if we have this in play, do all employees get an independent investigation? No. Uh, what happens is if there is an allegation of lying, it would be investigated by, depending on where the employee is situated, the human resources department or the department's management, uh, and they would. There's a process. Employees are, are uh, given a notice of investigation. They're interviewed. The evidence is collected. A report is made, and if it is found that the employee was untruthful, then there's discipline for that. So, in, in the case of the police department. Generally, it would be the uh, Professional Standards Bureau that would be doing that investigation. In this case, because of the, the nature of the allegation, the public nature of the allegation, uh, I thought it was important in this case, the severity of it, to bring in an outside independent review. Okay. I, you know, I understand it, um, but then once again, uh, this is where this comes into play of... Uh, equity and fairness for all employees and how do we how do we deliver that so you know just certain I, I believe certain units then get an independent investigation so I think we you know I get it and understand it but for the future I do think we should uh, look at our, our guidelines and our policies and uh, make sure they are enforceable Agreed. I think part of it is this is the significance of it, uh, Councilman. As you mentioned, equity doesn't always mean treating everyone exactly the same. Sometimes it's different. In this case, there's there would be a difference between an employee being asked, you know, why were you late for work, and they told what turned out to be a lie as to why they were late, right? As compared to employees are being accused of lying in a court of law in a legal proceeding. That's a much more severe allegation of lying than the, the hypothetical example I gave you earlier. So it was my judgment in this case, because of the severity of the nature of this, uh, of, of, the, of the accusation, that it warranted a, a really intense and independent view. Any additional council member comments? Roll call on Councilwoman Vice Mayor Williams uh, motion to deny petitions. Garcia. Mayor, may I explain my vote? Please do. Thank you. So I'll be voting no, um, but I, I do want to recognize that this is the first time we're having this conversation. 
And so if anything, I wanna thank those folks with the citizen petition for pushing us to have this conversation. I wish it was more in depth. Um, and I hope both to, to you, Ed, when, when those results come back, and again, to you, Mayor, that we can continue this conversation because I do believe um, the this is really serious. And so I hope um, we can find the space as an entire council um, in the future to take this on. Um, and to Councilman Alkowski, um, this is something that you could have put on public safety subcommittee. I believe there's one left. Um, there may be a conversation we have there, or we'll wait and see who the folks are um, in the public safety subcommittee moving forward. So thank you, I'm voting no. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Castor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Gallego. Yes. That's a seven one. Thank you. That is our final agendized item. We will now turn to resident comment. I will ask our city attorney to introduce this portion of our meeting. Thank you, Mayor. During citizen comment, members of the public may address the city council for up to three minutes on issues of interest or concern to them. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits the city council to listen to the comments, but prohibits council members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. Thank you. And Matt, could you please call the members of the public? Yes, Mayor. Our first speaker is Summer Bagley. Summer, are you on the line? Good evening. Please proceed. Can you hear me? Thank you. This council took an oath uh, to defend and protect the Constitution, our state Constitution, and to do their job well. You swore to not restrict the rights of the people. Yet here we are one year later. Article two under Arizona Constitution states, all political power is inherent to the people, in the people, and governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed and are established to protect and maintain individual rights. Mayor Gallego, you have been quoted as saying, the reasoning for the continuation of the mask mandate in Phoenix is health expert recommendations that masks are the best technique for staying ahead of COVID-19 and the best and fastest way to fully reopen and recover. I would like to see this data and any of the studies supporting this for the public since I have yet to see any of this substantiated um, in the media or otherwise. The public deserves proof and data and not sweeping assumptions. Your continued mass requirements are an egregious overstep of power and infringement upon our rights as you swore to uphold. City Council shall have the power to make, amend, and rescind regulations necessary for emergency management, but such regulations shall not be inconsistent with the governor. And I find that we are inconsistent with the governor at this time. I feel, I feel like there's a lot of confusion surrounding this, and I hope that that is cleared up as soon as possible. In closing, I would like to speak to the mayor for closing our Phoenix parks this weekend during Easter. I hope the message got back to you loud and clear that we the people will not stand for this unhingement and will not stand for this any longer. Easter weekend, um, we followed the governor's order and enjoyed our time in our public parks safely parked in the parking lot where we should be. And my children saw that their mother stood for our rights, our inalienable rights, and will continue to do so in our public spaces where we have the right to be, to gather and to protest. Thank you and good evening. Our next speaker is Maddie Finney. Maddie, are you on the line? I am, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. All right, thank you for listening tonight. I actually, this is my first city council meeting and it was really cool to listen to. So thank you and thank you all for working for us. But um, I wanted to start with saying I have, uh, 
Elizabeth Venable is how I found out about the city council meeting tonight, and I was here for her GoFund uh, Fund for Empowerment project, and she asked me to speak about any concerns I might have for any minority communities. So uh, I've personally used resources from the city, from Arizona Helping Hands, for uh, training resources. They train me to be a Starbucks officially trained employee and using their uh, the Umam Day News Center, the Helping Hands Cafe. I got to work there and eventually got a job at a Starbucks in a Barnes and Noble up in Happy Valley. And uh, today I'm a freelance field technician and working for myself and hiring my friends. So that was really the start of that for me. Um, I bring that up because a couple years ago, I had a very close friend that was going through some domestic violence experiences at home. And I tried to look up resources for him and was unable to find anything that a man could use for situations I had been so thoroughly helped in. And that really hurt me very deeply because they deserve just as much resources and help as we do. And I know for me through experience and academic study that the only way a person can really help themselves is if they feel safe, understood, and valued. And if we can help give people this, then they can experience the fulfillment I got to experience of helping themselves. And I was wondering what, if, if there are any resources in the Valley for just men experiencing situations like this, and if there are, how to find them, because I am a freelance field technician, which mostly means I work with a lot of computers, um, and I couldn't find anything. And I'd like to think I'm pretty decent at my job in computering. So if there's something to be had, I'd love to be directed towards it. And if there's not, how can I help build that for our communities? Thank you. That's all. Mayor, I believe that is our last speaker for citizen comment. So I've checked. IT uh, confirms that. So that was our last speaker. Wonderful. Thank you all for your participation. We are adjourned.